Hi there. Hi. Well, welcome to whatever we're about to do, because this is a huge experiment. Um, uh, I'm Nick Mason, the Living Dead drummer. Today, I'm sitting here with my buddy, John Bermuda Schwartz from the Weird Al Yankovic band. Um, how you been, man? It's been a couple oh. of months I've seen you. Well, how, so how have I been? Oh, yeah. you know, I've been uh, sitting around the house and, and uh, you know, waiting to get back out, wait, waiting for those gigs, you know, it's been right. pretty quiet. Yeah, uh, for most people, it, it's, that's what's been going on the last couple of months is um, a lot of canceled tours, a lot of canceled local shows, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, we're all, we've all been kind of dealing with it. Um, so you're, you're in the same boat as everybody else. It's not like any one musician right now is having like Oh, this was a bad year. It was like, no, it's for across the board. It's not independent to any one person. So. Uh, yeah. Well, you're you're doing okay. You're you're keeping busy. You're the busiest guy I know. I well, thank you. I I I guess I just figure out ways to make myself busy because I don't want to sit around or anything like that. So I've been I've been very lucky and fortunate, and I'm definitely not taking it for granted that I've been doing okay during the you know this oddball year that we've been having and stuff like that so but that kind of brought upon this and, and what we're doing here is um you and i have gone out to coffee and sat at a you know a starbucks or whatever and sat and there you go and uh just talked drums and talked music and talked life and um i used to do that with a lot of my musician friends and a lot of my drummer buddies that um I, there's a a coffee spot down the street here that would be very common to see me in there with another musician, another drummer, usually for like three hours, having a couple cups of coffee and just talking about the latest gear, the latest, whatever tricks, stuff that happened on tour, whatever. And I miss doing that. Um, I miss doing that with you. I miss doing that with all of my other musician friends because now a lot of those places, you know, aren't open unless they have outdoor seating and not everyone's comfortable getting together yet. And, um, so I thought, well, why not, like, we have this technology in front of us. Why not just utilize this and get a little time with your friends and continue the, the dumb conversations that no one likes to have, but us. <laughs> well, it's, it's a great idea. And, and, uh, thank you for having me on and, uh, you know, uh, well, happy to be here. I'm glad you agreed to it. Um, so I was trying to go back and, and figure out, first of all, like when we first met, we've known each other for several years at this point. Um, and I couldn't quite play it. Maybe your memory is better than mine on it. I couldn't quite place it. I know we have a lot of mutual friends. I know that we hang out at the NAMM show every year. I know that we're in a lot, we run in a lot of the same circles um, with like drumming websites and message boards and stuff like that. So I have to feel like it was some sort of gradual progression from talking about drum gear online to being in the same place at the same time and then making that connection. But I, I, I couldn't single out and pinpoint one specific instance or memory where I was like, Oh yeah, we met at this place. I don't know if you remember any of that or not. I, I certainly don't. <laughs> it was, it was November 11th. of uh, no. <laughs> I was going to say, see, but <laughs> I, uh, I I don't remember either. I mean, uh, did you ever frequent Chad Sexton's Drum City? No, I I actually had then never been there. Was not was not there. Okay, uh, I I don't uh, you know very likely Nam and and uh, it it went from there. Probably. I, I, I'm get I'm guessing Nam. Probably. But, uh, maybe a mutual friend or so like Ian or somebody introduced us to to one uh, po person. Possibly, yeah. It's a distinct possibly. possibility. Um, but I was just trying to figure it out and stuff like that. Um, but I'll well, say I, that I'd been listening to you for pretty much my entire life. You've been with Weird Al since what, like 1980, right? 1980. September 14th, 1980 was the, the night I met him and the very first recording I did with him, as it happens. Wow, you have the exact date. Memorized. Well, that's, that's a date that will live... Uh, well, it lives up here anyway. Yeah. Uh, I, no, that's, that was an important date... Uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One, that's the night we did another one, Rides the Bus, which uh, uh, helped break <laughs> Al nationally. There's a whole story about that. That, that'll be uh, when you have Al on the podcast someday. Okay, right. And, but we just, we know what date that is because it's the night we met. 
as well. And I got to play on this thing he did on the air that became a single. In fact, it, it went on the first album as well. Uh, now, by that time, we had a band together. But, you know, that night he didn't have anybody. And, and you know, we recorded this thing. And I said, uh, you know, you should have a band. I'll be your drummer. And he didn't know what I, so he said, okay, you know, like, great, uh, we'll talk someday. So we exchanged numbers. He went back to school in San Luis Obispo. He was finishing up shortly. And, and another one rides the bus on the Dr. Demento show, took off nationally and, uh, and was beginning to get played in morning drive time in big markets. It wasn't just a Demento thing anymore. The, the morning zoo guys would listen to the Dr. Demento show that had aired on their show the, the night before. And then Monday morning, they'd pull songs off to play you know, and, and then the wacky zoo, whatever. And they play another one rights to us. Now Al is getting played in major markets to major, you know, uh, acclaim or, or laughs or whatever. And that really, that was a, a turning point. There've been several turning points, but that was a big one. So that whole episode that night that led to that song that led to that, you know, going forward, he got himself a manager. I mean, things began to move at that point. So that is a date that will live, you know, it's a very important date in our, in our memories. Wow, that that's awesome. That's that's a very. It's good that you have all that stuff documented. I mean, I, I'm sure. If something that monumental were to happen, anybody should at least kind of remember those details, kind of thing. If somebody asked me that about a band I've been, I'd be like, I don't know. I just, <laughs> um, I mean, I remember seeing like the whole story behind. The, I I remember watching like behind the music on VH1 with you guys. Um, yeah, and when I first got introduced to Al's music and stuff like that was a little bit later. I was still a kid. It was like the early nineties and um, the record uh, bad hair day came out. Yeah. 96 was bad hair day. Okay. So mid nineties. So I was a little bit older than I thought it was, <clears throat> but uh, I remember me, me and like my best friend, we each got copies of that and we just wore that CD out and just would listen to it all day, every day and laugh. And that, brought in um, me going through like the back catalog and seeing some of the stuff that had already been around that I was unaware of. Cause in, in 96, I was like, I don't, uh, I don't know, maybe like 13 or 14 years. Oh. Old. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wow. <laughs> I'm not do that to you. <laughs> I've been in this band longer than you've been alive. We had gold records since before you've been alive. Wow. You, well, you mentioned earlier before we were taping, the, you know, going to the Anchor Bar in 1984, and I didn't want to say anything, but I was like, I was 20 years old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but the, anyway, so I was, you know, probably like, you said that was 96. I was probably in like eighth grade or something like that, mm. uh, seventh or eighth grade. And, and that's what introduced me to, to even the world of like, oh, people make songs that are fun. Um, and, and I had been a fan since then. And then it was kind of cool that, you know, years later, you end up just, you go from being a fan to just being friends and being buddies with these people and stuff like that, which is just a great natural progression, I guess, of being in the same career field. Um, but I was trying to go through those mental gymnastics of like, okay, so I remember when I first heard you guys and what turned me on to you in the first place. And then I remember watching the behind the music and stuff like that. But then I was trying to play, sorry, when did you and I first meet? I couldn't remember. We've known each other so many years at this point. I couldn't. It's, it's been eight, eight or 10 years or long. I don't know. It's yeah, been... at least. So anyway, I was just trying to figure that stuff out. Um, so to swing around, you, you know, you mentioned you've been kind of at home the last couple months and stuff like that. Um, what have you been up to? these last several months where live music is kind of not a thing. Um, everyone's had their tours canceled or postponed or rescheduled or whatever it is. I have like a fortune in airline credit right now <laughs> because I was supposed to be on the road with a couple different groups in the spring and throughout the summer. I had bands that I had like just gotten hired by in March and wasn't even allowed to talk about yet because the labels were releasing their albums in the spring and then we were going to hit the road in the summer and then the labels all of a sudden said we're not releasing it now because why you know and now they're those records are coming out now they both come out um in July 
but the plan is still like the call I got is like, hey, record's coming out in July. What does that mean for for me? Well, we got to wait and see. You know, we can't go on the road until question mark. So what, you know, um, it's pretty public knowledge if you follow me on social media, what I've been keeping up with. But what have you been keeping up with the last several months now that we can't go and play a gig? Well, uh, you know, well, first off with Al, and that's, that's kind of, Al is my day job right. uh, for all these years. And, and uh, you know, happily or, or unhappily, we weren't on the road this year anyway. This was our year off. We do two years on, one year off. This was our year off to begin with. So I'm, I'm not making any money anyway, which I already planned for, and, and it's not a big surprise. Uh, we, we had begun to line up a tour for next year, and... Uh, I'm pretty sure there will be a tour next year, but it's not going to happen quite as early as we thought. I don't, I don't really know. You know, I'm hoping later this year we'll have a little bit of an idea what the next year is going to look like. Uh, but apart from that, you know, I sit at the drums now and then in practice and, uh, you know, and play to, to uh, records, not, not Al's records. I don't want to play that stuff, but <laughs> unless I get paid. No, I, I, uh, no, sometimes, you know, sometimes I, I put on the Al stuff and I, and I go through and I, I play the stuff. It's like, oh, I'm playing to myself. That's cool. And like, I forget things, you know, and it's just like, hey, what's that thing on the record? That wasn't me. And I said, no, it was me. And, and, you know, I'll just sit down and just make some noise or, or whatever. And, you know, about once a week, I'll sit down and see if I can still do an open roll. And it's like, yeah, I, you know, I can still do that. And that's, you know, music wise, that's, that's kind of it. You know, I've been tidying up just, uh, my archives, uh, uh, you know, my personal stuff, going through and organizing photos and things like that. Oh, well, photos, that sort of leads me to something that's been going on. And, uh, and I, want, I want you to talk about that. Like, I know what it is, but I need, I need you okay. to people about it. Oh, no, I, I, I will. So about, about three years ago, I, uh, uh, in, and I had, was just wrapping up archiving all of my tapes, all of my uh, cassette tapes and stuff to digital. And uh, I don't have a single tape left, not reels, nothing. And everything's now DATS, everything is now digitized and permanent and backed up five different ways and you know, will outlive me uh, or, or its usefulness. Uh, and then I began to think, you know, I, I'd always taken a lot of photos. I always had film cameras, uh, you know, when I was in, uh, uh, just coming out of high school, I had, you know, had fairly nice cameras for, for a kid. I had a dark room at home so I could, develop and, and print my own black and white film and stuff like that. And, and uh, with Al, I shot a lot of photos on the, I mean, a ton of stuff, you know, before did even before digital. In fact, now that digital's here, I'm not shooting as much as I did when I had to pay for it. <laughs> so I, I've got all these negatives, so, you know, hundreds and hundreds of rolls of negatives sitting around. So I figured, well, next in archiving, they don't deteriorate the, deteriorate the way tape does, but you know, I want to get this stuff digitized so I can do stuff with it. So I don't have to, if I want to do something with the photo, I don't have to scan it and then retouch it and do all the stuff. You know, I want to get it right from the negative, right from the source. So uh, I, I came across, I sort of always knew it was there, but I came across a bunch of photos of early Al stuff back in the early mid eighties that I shot black and white. And none of these things have ever been seen. Uh, they, they're proof, they're contact sheets. And then that's the extent of it. And then they've been in my file cabinet for 35 years. And I'm thinking, you know, it'd be cool to, you know, I'll, I'll get these digitized along, along with the other stuff. And I thought, you know, I wonder if people have seen all these color photos, you know, online and in other publications and stuff, all these years, they've, they've seen a bunch of my photos, but they've never seen these photos before, you know, un, unseen, you know, Al has never seen them. I mean, no one's, you know, and I, I've never really seen them because they've been like this big, you know, they've been like on a contact sheet. So, uh, you know, I never, uh, a handful of the early ones were done up as eight by tens and some of those got published, but beyond that, you know, so I, I began to think about uh, uh, getting those digitized and it occurred to me, maybe I would do a book of photos. And this was literally three years ago. It was like July of 2017. And I ran it by Al. I said, do you mind? I've got a bunch of black and white photos, you know, that nobody has seen. Do you mind if, uh, you know, I, I pick out the best ones and, and you know, figure out if there's a way to get them published. He says, yeah, go for it. Have, you know, have fun. So I, I looked into self-publishing and didn't do much about it. Didn't do much about anything. Didn't get them digitized. Didn't do anything. Two years later, last year now, uh, I was in New York City. We were doing a gig and one of our connections at Sony 
uh, was there. And I worked with him very closely on the last, on the box set that came out a few years ago. And so we were chatting and, and uh, I said, you know, I've been sort of in the back of my mind, I've, I've had this idea for putting out this photo book on old stuff of Al, you know, you know, that has never been released. And he says, oh, you know, how, how nice for you. Okay. Anyway, a couple of months later, he emails me. He says, if you're, when you're ready to move forward with the uh, photo book, talk to this guy. He's a friend of mine, his publisher. And it might be a good fit. So, uh, and I, I, you know, like, great. A couple more months went by and now I'm starting to take the negatives in to test to see if they're digitized, how they're going to come out. And I took some in and they looked great. I took two rolls to a place locally, looked wonderful. Uh, clean, crisp, uh, very little retouching necessary. They do a certain amount of balancing on them, so I didn't have to work with them too much. But it was really cool to see for the first time these photos that had only existed as literally the size of a 35 millimeter frame. And now I'm seeing them on, on a big screen and I can zoom in and, and all this stuff. Uh, so I went back to the guy from Sony, his email, and I looked up, you know, and I, and I wrote him back. I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready. You know, I think, I think I'm ready to do this. Send this guy my email. Anyway, we, we uh, connected. This was early December of last year. And we connected and uh, a week later signed a contract for the book. Oh, wow. That, that so there, there is a book in the works. Now this, I should say, and that's what I've been, a lot of what I've been working on during this downtime, but I got to say it was in the works prior to this happening. And when the COVID became a, a real thing, like in March, you know, the question was, and all the photos and the text were all completed. We were, we were working on cover designs at that point. And, and they said, you know, despite all the, the, the virus stuff, we're going to go ahead, we're going to print it, we're going to have it ready to go. You know, we're not sure if Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all of them are taking a new product, uh, you know, by the time it's ready, but we're going to have the book ready because the instant they do, they're going to ship, we're going to be good. I said, okay, let's do it. And they are, it's, it's been at the printer. Uh, we're going to see real life copies shortly. We're, we're seeing layouts already. Uh, the book is released on October 27th and it is called Black and White and Weird All Over, The Lost Photographs of Weird Al Yankovic, 1983 to 86. And in fact, I want, I've, I've got a picture of, I don't, I don't have a book yet. They're still at the printers. Uh, I'll see them probably early September. I, oh, by the way, I, I, uh, this green screen, I was talking to someone when I got on Zoom, they said, uh, you know, uh, one of my nephews or something said, you should, if you're going to do Zoom, you should get yourself a green screen. I thought, oh, cool. So I'm looking and it's a, it's a little stark. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know what he was thinking, but anyway, I, I kid, I kid. I, I know the difference. I know what's here. Let's, let's get a real background up here. All right. Green screen now. How about magenta? How's that? How does that strike you? I got a better idea. It's bright on the eyes. All right. Oh, how, about, how about the book? That... Black and white and weird all over. The lost photographs of weird Al Yankovic. Anyway, it's all, it's all black and white, hence black and weird all over. And uh, uh, it, uh, it's 200 and some odd pages. I don't know. A bunch of stuff. It's 9 by 12, hardcover book. Uh, and some of, the, some of the photos go across both pages. There's, there's one photo of uh, the, the four of the five of us, sorry, the four of us. Uh, so me, Jim, Steve, Al, and Dr. Demento on the set of the I Love Rocky Road video. And we're just standing out by a plane. And one of my friends who had who shares a photo credit with me. Otherwise, I took all the photos except for the ones I'm in, of course. And we put that in in across two pages, so it'd be a great. It's the only picture where we're all together, and it's got some space on it. And if people, somebody wants the book signed, they bring it to a show or something. We can all sign that page. But my question to the publisher was, well, that's nice that it goes across both pages, but what about the gutter? It's gonna it's gonna you know do that, and not like our faces in there, but it's gonna sort of interrupt the flow of the photo. He says, no, the way we do it. And I think he called it, it's, instead of being a glued on the edges, it's going to be side sewn, which means the book kind of opens up and lays flat. I mean, you could see there's a, but it, it pretty much lays flat. It lays flat as one big, really 12 by 18 photo. Oh, wow. So, so there's a few of those in the book, but you know, a lot of the others are, are full page. Uh, Al is very cool and very graciously wrote the foreword to the book. And it's, it's very, uh, it's funny, but it's sincere. I mean, it's really, it's, it's so Al. And, and the publisher looked at that. He says, that, that may be the best foreword I've ever read. Oh, that's outstanding. And, that's and did, didn't, didn't change a thing about it. I mean, all the stuff, I, and I wrote the intro to the book. And I wrote the 
characterized by uh, there's there's uh, four different videos that over the Ricky video and I love Rocky. I said you haven't seen these. These are these are different. These are different shots, and the fact that they're in black and white. And I guess I thought at the time they needed to be documented and kind of that it gives a certain vibe when something's in black and white. And the, I just never you know we didn't have computers then, so there was really nothing to do with them. I couldn't post them anywhere, and I didn't print them. And uh, only recently you know did have I really seen them. And now when this book comes out. Uh, the rest of the world will see them. So that's going to be a pretty cool deal. So that, that hits October 27th. And in fact, on August 10th is when the book was announced. And there's a website for that. It's black and white and weird all over dot com. Or I should say, in case you don't know how to spell weird, you can remember that when you learned in school that that rule, E before I, that's weird. Remember that? Okay. So that's I don't, e, e before I. I was W-E-I-R. <laughs> well, there's some I before E thing, but it doesn't apply. So W E I R D. Oh, and also for the people that are clever, they're going to see that black and white and weird all over also says black and white and weird Al lover. Sneaky. Yeah, you know what? All right. Sneaky. I, weird Al lover. I get it. And I went. I went to the. Actually, that title that title was given me to me by a, a friend of mine, friend of ours, actually, friend of Al's, named Mark Jonathan Davis. He's also Richard Cheese of Lounge Against the Machine. Yeah. Uh, and he he gave me that title. He very kindly gave that to me. And and it didn't strike me at first, you know, that it said Weird Al Lover on it. And I went back to him. I said, oh, it's very, very sly of you to do that. He said, I, I swear I had no idea. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. So. I I don't think I would have noticed that if you hadn't pointed it out, but now that you did, all I see is... Now that's all you can think about. <laughs> all I'm think about. So I, I know that I was going to wait to see how the fans, you know, how long it took them to figure it out. And some of them would figure it out right away. They figure out stuff about us that we don't even know. So somebody would see that and go, oh, Weird Al lover, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but now when they see the podcast, they're going to go, oh, yeah, now we spilled the beans. Now we know what they were thinking. Right, exactly. So, and it works either way. The title works either way. So that's cool. I will, uh, you know what, I uh, uh, I have another, of course, uh, background with uh, more book stuff. There you go. And, uh, I like that oh, one. Oh, wait. It's that photo of him doing that. That's silly. <laughs> oh, well. Uh-oh, my green screen's not working. Uh-oh, that's, our, that's, that's we, not good. Uh, it'll be fine. That, that's it'll still be fine. Background. Um, All right. There was, we're probably going to have a couple of weird edits in in you talking about the book. My internet connection got slow for a second, and you're in a library now, and so people are going to think every, something's totally messed up. No, um, uh, things froze up a little bit, and then like it caught up. So I don't think it missed anything you said. If anything, I'm just going to have to cut and edit a couple things. Okay. Or at least All try. Right. To. Yeah, this is, this is actually my CD library. It, that's that. That's really for that's your place, yeah. like CD library. Yeah. Wow. I've got about 3,100 titles. I, I don't. I have a couple of stacks of CDs in the corner of my bedroom that once in a while I'll fish through and pull out something that I used to listen to 20 years ago and put it in the car. But I, I kind of stopped collecting CDs unless it's something I really, really want or, or someone I really admire or something. Then I'll, I like having the physical CD. Yeah. And lately I've got been going down the vinyl rabbit hole, which I always swore that off. And then just honestly, in like the last two, three months, I've been like, oh, I don't know. it's kind of fun playing this on vinyl. <laughs> so, well, the book sounds awesome. I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to, oh. to see some of those old photos and stuff like that. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. That sounds really, really cool. And I, like you said, that's been able to occupy a lot of your time over the last several months. So it doesn't sound like you're sitting around the house twiddling your thumbs at all. It, you're not, not much. I mean, I, ironically, uh, maybe not a big surprise. You know, uh, my wife and I are eating better. You know, we're not eating out at all. Uh, I mean, at all. Literally in the last, March 13th was the last time we ate out. And I remember that because we were coming back from a short trip and everything was just about to shut down. Uh, I think Governor Newsom was was saying, you know what, we're going to have to do something. Mm -hmm. And it was just starting to hit the fan right then and there. And that's the last time we ate out. I think one time I was driving past an In-N-Out burger and there wasn't a line and I called her up. I said, I, I got to have a burger. Come on, I'll bring us some burgers. And that's literally the only thing we've had in the last four months. So we're, we're eating better. We're losing weight. I got a lot of time, so I'm back on the treadmill. Uh, 
We're not driving anywhere, so I haven't put gas in the car in two months. Uh, we're saving money. We're fine. And, and honestly, she, she retired a long time ago. This is a year off for me, so we're at home anyway. This is not that traumatic, you know, except we've had a couple of trips canceled. And unfortunately, and, and it's, uh, you know, nothing I could do about that. I was actually going to Bermuda. We were both going to Bermuda for, a, for like a drum camp thing. And uh, the first week of June, and, and that was canceled, I think, back in April. You know, they just knew it, it wasn't going to happen. And, and good thing. Yeah. We had, you know, there's a couple other things were going on that are all going to get postponed till next year. And, and uh, which is, it is what it is. You know, things will get back to normal when there's a vaccine. And, you know, it'll get back to normal and this will all be just behind us and we'll be in clubs and we'll be at concerts and ball games. And honestly, it's going to get back to, it, it always does. It always goes back to the way it was. And, uh, you know, maybe things will change a little bit in restaurants. They'll be a little more careful at concert venues and, and ballparks. Maybe they'll wipe down the, the arms and the, the chairs a little bit, you know, more diligently, but we'll all be back doing what we do, you know. And, and that's the hope. And I'm glad you've been staying healthy during it. And like you said, eating better and stuff like that. I too have been eating out less. Um, I, I did the in and out thing last week, just like you did. <laughs> First time in four or five months that I've had in and out burger was last week. Um, and like you, I was driving by and there was no line and I was like, uh Oh, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but no, I kind of the same boat. Uh, my car, needed a major repair like right at the beginning of this thing like right first week of april my car died and it was a huge repair and i was like this close to even just thinking maybe i should just sell it and and buy something else and then i was like nah, you know i don't really need it right now my studio where i'm at right now is a mile from my house so i was like well i'll just walk so i let the car go to a repair shop. And I said, take your time with it. And um, even after I got it back, I still walk here every day. So I'm getting exercise walking back and forth every day. I like, I pack a lunch, like I'm going to school, right? I make it, I make some uh, a healthy sandwich and put some snacks and stuff in there. And I pack a lunch and I walk a mile here. And then I'm here all day. And then I walk home at dinner time. And that's, been kind of it so i'm getting exercise and eating healthy like you are i i will occasionally um still order food but i try to do only small businesses like i won't go to a fast food chain anymore or anything like that there's a little diner on the corner that is run by like the sweetest elderly woman in the world and they've been only able to do like pickup orders no one can dine in the restaurant they don't have outdoor seating um, so about once a week, I was ordering lunch from them and then walking down the block and picking it up and coming back just to try and support a local business. Yeah. Um, so I was still doing that a little bit. Um, but yeah, trying to keep healthy and not spend money on gas and save money and stuff like that. I'm kind of the same boat as you actually during most of it. The only difference is I'm locked in this room all day, every day from, I, I get here at about nine maybe 10 in the morning and then leave at eight at night and I, wow. you know, I don't really use sunlight, just in the windows. <laughs> so. It's almost like a real job. Almost. I like I said, <laughs> pack a lunch, like I'm going to school and I kind of almost come in and punch a clock and, you know, um, and like you, I had a couple of trips canceled. I usually, um, try to take off like 4th of July weekend and, and get out of town or something like that. And I was going to do that this year. And then two days beforehand is when they announced that they were closing everything back down again for the 4th of July weekend. And I had to call the hotel and cancel my reservation. And then a week after that, I was supposed to go back East to New York, visit family. And I was going to teach some lessons while I was out there. Um, and uh, my, for Christmas, my sister-in-law, as a gift to my parents decided to give them like um, uh, an appointment for a family photo. And it was going to be my dad and my stepmom, my two stepbrothers, their wives, their kids and me. So, cause we don't really have that many photos of like the entire family together. Um, very, very, very few photos of us all together like that for whatever reason. So she made it a point to like, let's do, let's actually like sit and pose and dress nice and do a family photo they've had to postpone it like four times now because I can't fly out. 
I was supposed to go in April and then we bumped it to May and then we bumped it to June and then July and I had plane tickets booked. And then a week before I w the flight is when New York put the flight restrictions on California. Oh, yeah. I had to have done a 14 day quarantine and I was only flying back for five days as it was. So it was like, well, I, I got to cancel it again. And I got to wait for them to lift the flight restrictions for me to actually reschedule the flight now. But oh, like you said, <laughs> it, it'll get back to normal. Um, it, it will. You, you're and, and we'll be glad. And, and the, the fans will be hungry to come see us play and uh, be hungry to, to read, to see old photos of Al and I, uh, stuff like that. And I know. think so. Well, I generally hope so. I, I think it's going to be great. And and well and speaking of tour and I got all right I got a couple things that I've actually been dying to ask you for like honestly since before I knew you these were curiosities specifically about you that I had and I never brought them up because I was like usually we're just like hanging out having coffee or hanging out at a trade show or talking online or something like that it, I just never had like a weird opportunity where I was like hey so this specific nerdy drum thing right so doing it this way has is basically self-serving giving myself a platform to ask my friends questions that i've been curious about the whole time so okay. one like i've been going down the the rabbit hole of recording um i've never had to do this before on my own ever i would get booked on a recording session um and i would pack up my drums and i'd go to a studio set them up play them and then I'd leave and then it's out of my hands and I don't really have any kind of experience on outside of just that until the last several months where I've been forced to be my own engineer and producer and everything and and do everything on my own uh in fact you and I have done records at the same studio a couple of Al's records were done at uh what's that place in Silver Lake uh, man, I'm drawing a blank, and I should have had that one loaded. Silver Lake, near it. It's not quite Silver Lake. It's kind not, of not Burbank. No, I don't. So, not, not, uh, not it, Silver Lake. It's a big place, and they got it's they, it's recording studio, but they also have like lockouts and showcase rooms and rent by the hour. Oh, 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 uh, 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 bedrock. Right. Yeah. Bedrock. <laughs> Um, yes, right, 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 right. Okay, yeah. You've done some stuff with Al there, right? Well, we've, we've, we've rehearsed there a little bit, but we did actually cut a couple of things there. So, yeah. yes, that's right. I've yes. done, I've done a handful of records there as well, uh, actually. I um, With the Rhythm Coffin, that's where we did our last two records were, was there. And then um, the, the new record was done here. But um, uh, so the the recording like rabbit hole I said right so one of the things that you guys have always done specifically with with Al's band is when you're doing a parody song of an already established song right and the one that always comes to mind when I'm thinking of this too is when you guys did the Nirvana song right yeah um one of the things that always piqued my curiosity was how authentic to the original version of the song you guys were able to sound. And if there's like weird trade secrets and things that you're not allowed to talk about, by all means, like just say so and I won't push the issue. No, no. Well, well sound wise, it wasn't really such an issue. I mean, we get, you know, we've gotten much better at sounds, uh, you know, with each successive album. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the beginning, people would say, oh, we, we like that, you know, that Michael Jackson, that, that uh, beat it parody, eat it. It sounds just like Michael. And it's like, right. no, it doesn't, doesn't really sound just like him. I mean, it's, you know, well, sounds re mo mostly reminiscent. You know, maybe it's 80% there, but it's not really. Now, if we were to do that now, it would be like 99.9% .9 there. You would, if you didn't hear the lyrics, you wouldn't know one song from the other. We've right. gotten a, a lot better, not only personally, but from a production standpoint, uh, you know, we've just, we've gotten a lot more keen with that. But let's, like, for example, Smells Like Nirvana. Uh, that was, uh, you know, sound-wise, that wasn't that difficult. I mean, doing acoustic songs is not that difficult, uh, you know, for the most part. And and being just sort of a garage rock, you know, or grunge, if, if you will, 
uh, that wasn't that hard to do. You know, a lot of the sound and production comes from the guitar players and the bass players' stomp boxes and their effects and all of that stuff. And, and you know, drums are just, you know, they're made, you know, nice and meaty and, and you know. Uh, but the, uh, the thing with that song, and because, you know, Dave Grohl, you know, they didn't cut that to a click, and, and we used to click, uh, starting back in 84, we, we used to click on virtually everything. Yeah. And uh, we we used to click on that, and we and it didn't it worked against us because it smells like Teen Spirit ebbs and flows quite a bit, and that was and when we did it to a straight click, you could really hear that it didn't it was off enough, you know. I mean, we were right, yeah. but it was <laughs> it was off enough from the original to know that it it was not it didn't quite have the same feel. So they went in, you know, in, in 1990 to technology, and and. Uh, had to digitize certain stuff and we were still recording the tape at the time but they went in and and ran stuff i don't know what the, if it was an ams or what kind of old digital device it was and and sort of massaged the choruses and made them a little faster then brought it back down for the so it's no longer to a click now the way we got around that later if something ebbed and flowed a little bit and we wanted to emulate it we built in the click to do that we made a tempo map and it literally we, we followed that. And mostly it was easy to follow. I'm great with a click, but I don't mind if it moves because if it's a part of song that feels like it should move anyway, I'm already there. I don't have to fight it, you know, to, to stay on a click. I go where the click goes and then I come back when it comes back. And it's a very natural thing to, to ebb and flow with that. We did, uh, and, and once that technology, once, once Al's, you know, sort of thinking ahead on that stuff, he would build a track that would be, that would move, at, you know, if the original song did. I mean, obviously songs that are programmed don't do that. But, you know, if it was a live song, that's what we would do. But Smells Like Nirvana in particular had to be massaged after the fact. And and it's still, you know, I listen to that. I mean, Dave, I, I'm not going to talk about Dave Grohl, but there's a reason that <laughs> we did another song that Dave also played on. And he was very hard to, to, uh, to emulate because his timing is, is very, it's very fluid. And he was playing to a thing that was a, a, a sequenced song and put live drums on top of it. And he was flamming all over the place. And when we got into the studio, uh, I said, do you want me to play this like Dave Grohl or do you want me to play it right? Because it can't be both. He says, no, I want you to play it right. So when we did it, and I've been used to playing to a click all these years, it was right on. Uh, this was in 99 actually and it was it was right on and and sounded superior far superior to the original track that Dave played on uh, and I don't want to say that was the case with the Smells Like Nirvana song but there's a lot of feel to that you know the song starts out and it's very kind of slow and then it picks up and then the choruses pick up and then it sort of settles back down and just it moves around and it's okay if it does that but you know you can't you can't say that that his time is necessarily really good it's neither here nor there, but I'm just saying, you know, could he work with a click? You know, he talks about not working with a click. I don't think he can, uh, as evidenced by the thing where he had to play to a, to a, a sequence, to a click. He couldn't do it. Uh, again, not here nor there. He could, he could buy me a thousand times over, but, <laughs> you know, and he plays much better guitar than, than I do. Uh, no, and he did a lot of very cool stuff. I mean, he really, you know, he, he was, he was a, a good drummer. But no, he's not. He's not one to be tied to a click. And for better or worse, that's that's Dave Grohl. And, and he's still getting work because he's Dave. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure he's. They want that feel, you know. Yeah. And speaking specifically about that, like, all right, so you have to go in and you have to emulate basically a hundred other drummers that that are on all of these other songs and stuff like that. So, do you try to get in their headspace of like are you saying in your head in your in the studio like play like Dave Grohl, play like Dave Grohl or are you saying just play the song? Where, like Well, there's there's two there's two things that go on. Okay. On on uh, when we're doing the parodies, we are doing the original song. We we don't there's no creative license with that. We do what is on the original. Period. Right. Uh, and, and that's, that's fine. I don't have to think, but I do have to, I do have to work. And, uh, some of the song, and if it's a sequence song, I do all of that stuff. I've, I've become a little bit of a sound designer over, I've been forced to do it either that or somebody else takes my job. 
Uh, I don't want that to happen. I'm the guy that is responsible for the drum parts, whether I'm playing them or, or if I'm just, you know, punching them in or lining them up in Pro Tools or whatever it is. Uh, and, and that takes good ears, and I've developed good ears over the years. Uh, so on, on the parodies, no, there's no, I don't have to think about it. I just have to recreate. And, and sometimes that's hard. You know, there's a lot of sounds. There's a lot of heavy production on a lot of the things we do, a lot of the songs that we parody. And, and there's no way of knowing what those producers, what those keyboard players, what those artists in some case did to get certain drum sounds. I mean, certain drum sounds aren't even sounds. You know, there's sounds that are combined. Two or three different sounds make up the snare. You know, uh, not to mention all the other studio effects that go on, which is beyond what I do. I mean, it's not my job to produce the drum sounds. It's my job to make the basic sound, knowing that when the engineer gets it and Al and he sit down, that they will massage it into place and put some room on it or whatever it takes. So I've, you know, originally I, I used to struggle with that. You know, back in the 80s, it was easy. You know, Lindrum, you had a DMX, you had Rollins, you knew what the sounds were. Well, by the late 80s, you know, early 90s and beyond, you know, sounds were being created and, and layered and, and all sorts of stuff. And you never really knew what they were. And my initial approach, it was very frustrating for me. I mean, I did pretty good, but uh, my initial approach was, you know, I really tried to figure out what they did. And it's like, no, it's not, it doesn't matter what they did. I, I know what that sounds like. I, I hear a little bit of a, in that snare, I hear this kind of snare. I hear a little bit of a knock. Maybe it's a rim click that they put on it layered in there. I hear a little bit of, little bit of splatter. Maybe there's a hand clap in there. And I, I go, I listen to that. What would I do to recreate that sound? Not, I don't need to know what they did. I need to know what I would do. And that's how, and then it became that, just that shift in perspective became very, uh, well, very good. I was able to get the sounds. And, and there have been almost no sounds I couldn't get. There's only one sound I couldn't ever really get. And I'll tell you about that real quick. Okay. Then, I'll get, then I'll get on to They're getting cool. into other drummers' heads. <laughs> there's, one, there's one sound where I, I really, I thought it was important enough and I wanted help. And it was, uh, we did a parody. Uh, uh, it was on the last album, I believe. And it was called Inactive. And it was a parody of, of uh, Radioactive by... Yeah, I know. I know the song "Radioactive." Radio. Yeah, about I can't. I can't think of the band. I'm sorry, but the drummer. The drummer was Daniel Platzman. Now, it was a programmed. You know, he he didn't play on that. But I got a hold of him. I said, you know, we're doing a parody of this, and I'm really just. I you know I I I can't quite. The snare is the one holdout, and it's a very signature kind of a thing. And there's something. It's a reverse thing that leads up with all this. Yep. And I can't. I'm about 80% there and I want to be 99%. I really, is there any way I can get the sample? And, and a couple of weeks went by and the deadline for going in and cutting the song is coming up. And I, I just, I woke up one morning, I thought I'm just going to go in and I just have to put the part I've got, you know, put the sound I've got that's almost there and just whatever. And I go in and I open up the computer to start working. I've got an email from their guitar player from Wayne, I forgot his last name. And he sent me a stem of a whole bunch of those snares from the track. He sent me about a 20 second thing of the actual snare, the actual track. And, and I listened to it and it's like, and there's like these, this filtering and a sweep and there's a reverse thing, but then it breaks and then it hit, does the hit. And it's just, it's stuff that I wasn't hearing buried in the track. Imagine dragons is the group. That's and, and, and I wasn't, and I wasn't, I, I would never, ever have got that. And it was just such a signature thing. I just, I didn't want to not have it sound really good. So I, li I lined it up. I still don't know how they got it, but I could tell there was stuff going on there that was beyond what I do. So I, I lined it all up and I, I made the stem for that. And I sent it off to the engineer. I said, do not EQ this. Do not compress it. Don't do, this is the actual, you know, this goes raw as it is. Don't mess with it. And that's how it went. So that sounds, that song sounds, you know, ninety nine percent there. That was that, for, that's the only time I've I've like asked for any help on something. That's pretty cool that the actual artists stepped in to help you recreate that, their song kind of thing. That's really cool. That's very um, unique. I, well, I uh, always wondered. I was like, so if you read in a magazine somewhere that they used a bell brass snare on this song, did you run out and buy a bell brass? Like I was always wondering that. And I know that you have like this insanely massive, huge drum collection, which I'm going to ask you about too. Um, but 
I, I was wondering, well, is that how the drum collection started? Was he just chasing sounds, trying to recreate them on these records and then accumulating, you know, a, a warehouse? Well, somewhat, somewhat. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, I know, you know, snares especially, I mean, we're all a real, you know, really concerned with snare sounds more, more than anything else, perhaps, you know, because they're just so, they're so cool, they're so signature, and there are so many different sounds available for so many different reasons. I mean, the, the, the size of the drum, the material of the drum, the thickness and, and density, the type of head, the type of hoops, the type of lugs, the type of wires, you know, where, where you hit the drum, how hard you hit it, how heavy is the stick you hit it with, you know, how tightly or loosely are the wires done, what kind of padding do you have on it? There's, there's like 20 different things going on with the way a single drum could sound, you know, the snare more than any other drum in the kit. So yes, initially, you know, for, for doing a lot of stuff, I would go out and buy snares. I would go out sometimes and buy kits if I needed a really, a very obvious big bass drum sound. And, and if I had a 22, I went out and I bought a kit that had a 26, had big toms, 26, 14, 15, 18 on the floor. Those, those were big, and they were power toms at that. So here's like a, like a 12 by 4. 14 tom on top of a 26 inch kick i had to almost play standing up it was ridiculous oh my god it, and, and it was and it was a great kit it was a terrific kit it was a yamaha kit i bought in 1980 and uh and i recorded and toured with that kit actually for a couple of years and and it was just but that's where i learned to sit up really high as that was the only way to get on top of the toms it was just it was crazy but that was a kit i bought i think for for a specific reason uh symbols now Symbols are something you can't change the sound of symbols. So if you want a simple sound, you have to go find that symbol. And that, that explains perhaps that was my impetus for collecting symbols, uh, which I, I have a, I, I have a, 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 a renowned symbol, a, a well-known yeah. uh, large amount of symbols. I have 1,027 symbols. Oh my God. Wow. And like from, I have too from many. From four inch, inch to, to 30 inch. <laughs> now, I, in, in all fairness, I use most of the time, I and mean, I, have, I have my set of symbols I use on the road, and in town, there's like four symbols I use for almost everything. But that wasn't always the case back in the day when I had to emulate a bunch of different sounds. Now, that also takes me back to, to not only sound-wise, but when we would do original songs, and half of the songs we do are Al's originals, uh, most of those are in the style and vibe of some of his favorite groups or some other popular group, B-52s, Devo, uh, uh, R.E.M. I mean, just whatever, whoever it is, we go for those kind of sounds. Uh, and when I go in and, you know, sound-wise, that's one thing, but when I go in and play, like, for example, we did a song a couple albums ago called Craigslist, and it was sort of Riders on the Storm by the Doors, a little bit of that, a little, you know, kind of, in fact, Ray Manzarek actually played keyboards on our song. Oh wow! That's not be, before he passed away, yeah. uh, obviously. So, right. so for example, on that, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to just copy a part. I mean, you can only get by. You know, you, you have to do two and four. I mean, there's a certain amount of, of duplication there. But I, my approach is, not even you know, there's that fill. I'm going to grab that fill that he did of this song, and I'm going to do it here. It's like, I'm going to do a fill that sounds like if John Densmore was coming in to play on Al's song, he would do it. He said, you know, John, I want you to sound like you did with the Doors, but not necessarily play exactly what you played, you know, 50 years ago. And that's how I have to approach it. I do have to get in their heads. How would John Densmore do this? How would Alan Myers from Devo do this? How would, uh, you know, how would, uh, uh, is it, is it uh, Bill Berry from uh, REM is the drummer? You know, how would he, approach a this you guys i know bill riflin was with them for well i mean bill berry was the original you know he oh, was, yeah, back, yeah. I was gonna say back, bill... back in their classic day he, so yeah. so you know i i have to get inside there you know, so what would these guys do on this song that's what i'm going to do and again not necessarily do exactly what they did but do what what they would do you know if al had called in these guys to play on the session what would they do in order to sound like you would know it's them so that's that's an exercise in itself now that the parodies, because we know exactly what we're playing or, or it's, you know, sequenced or whatever, we know what we have to do. We don't rehearse those. Well, there's no need. We know what the parts are. You we don't, we don't need to play them together until, until it's like, okay, rolling. That's, that's when we play these songs for the first time. You know, or I email them to somebody and he lines them up and, and you know, I, I hear about it later. Uh, 
but on the originals, we go through and, and there's a, a three-step process in doing these original songs. First, Al will present a demo that he records. Sometimes they're pretty elaborate. Sometimes they're very simple. Uh, may have lyrics, may not. And, and it's, you know, it's the melody, it's the arrangement, the bridge. Uh, you know, it's, it's the song the way he wants it, but it's like, okay, Jim, Jim on guitar, you know, uh, you, you'll know what kind of solo to do here. I want it in the vibe of, you know, REM, let's say, you know, or, or uh, you know, same for bass parts, and same for drum parts. And he may have a specific thing. He may have a specific fill or a specific lick he wants somewhere from one of us. And he'll tell us that. He says, you know, that little thing, I need you to do that. But other than that, you know, you, you do what you do. So he, we get a demo from him. We then go in and record, uh, we rehearse the songs the way that is, and, and then we massage them a little bit so he can hear what we're doing. And we cut a demo. We may actually just record the rehearsal, and then it becomes our demo. And then Al lives with that a little bit, and we live with that a little bit, and decide you know, if there's any more massaging that needs to be done. Usually we're about 95% there. You know, but once he starts to hear it, it's like then he starts hearing new things, or we start hearing new things. It's like I I should have done this there. I want to. I didn't want to do that fill there. I want to do it over here instead. You know, we so we make small adjustments, and we may run it through, uh, so we can actually hear what we're going to do in the studio, and then you know rolling, and then we play it literally. You know, that's when we do it. So we've already done it at that point. We're not one of these bands that goes into the studio and and writes and rehearses in the studio like they used to do in the 60s and 70s. I mean, that was a great luxury, I suppose. You know, bands would go in and they they book a studio for a month or two and they would literally write and and rehearse and record an album while they were they would just live in the studio. I mean, Fleetwood Mac was notorious for this. Yeah, I don't know uh, anyone that does that these days at no, all. No, like, you know, nobody would. Even, studio time is too precious. Yeah, first they off. Would, like you uh, like they do it like you guys do now where you kind of go through a demo phase and this and that and and add parts and move stuff around and then when you go to the studio it's like all right we're going to be here for like three days and yeah, we, we're ready we're, we're ready to go out and done the record's going to be done yeah I, like i said i don't know anybody that has the luxury of like we're moving into a studio for a month or anything like that i think that yeah i think the most time i've ever been allotted to track drums on a record is like maybe a week and that week was spread out over the course of like two years where i'd go in for like two days and then i wouldn't hear from the artist for six months and then they want me to come back in and do like another two or three songs and then i wouldn't hear from them for two months and then they want me to come back and do another two songs and by the end of it it you know two years time it equaled about five days and 12 songs or something stupid like that. But other than that, like no one ever gets the luxury of moving into a studio and being creative and, and coming up with a part and saying, let me, let's go lay this down right now. It's all doing it at home and emailing yeah. each other. And, you know, that's. Well, it's, it's economically and time-wise, it's, it's smart to do it that way. Well, my green screen is starting to, to fight back here. It happened a couple of times. <clears throat> But I'm like, ah, it's fine. It's just haloing around you a little bit. You're fine. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't like that background. Let's see. Let's, uh, you know, I miss playing. Let's do this. You got some drums? Oh, there, there we go. That's more there we go. requirement right there. What arena that's, is that? That's, I think that's in Little Rock, actually. Okay. That might be the last gig we did on the last tour. Uh, I, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it looks wow. like Little Rock. Uh, I don't remember if, I, I, I think we probably filled the bottom. We didn't fill, uh, you know, the, the top area, but, you know, we'll play for it's four or 5,000 people, nice. you know, a crack. Yeah. And that's fine. It's still a good so, one, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I get fed, you know, and I get, actually, I, you know, I, I was on the, re, on the, the uh, tour oh. for 15 weeks. All I got was this mug. <laughs> $200,000. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but I like the mug. mug. It's a very expensive mug. They said if I, well, they, they gave me a discount, actually. They didn't really give it to me. They said if I break it, I got to pay full price for the next one. So I'm very careful with it. There you go. You don't want to spend that six bucks or whatever. No, that's, uh, yeah, they believe me. <laughs> that's hysterical. So when you're, when you're transitioning from studio to live, let's say sound design wise again, right? So, all right, you've, you've gone through sampling and creating sounds and trying to emulate other artists and, and doing it in 
specific styles and stuff. So when it comes to live, like you can't have 10 snare drums next to you on your kit. So are you using triggers or nope. you're just like, this is the snare for the, the, the night yep. is going to, every song's going to run through this and it's not going to sound like the record, but you bought a ticket. So no, not <laughs> me. No, not me. Now, guitar, keyboards, bass, all that stuff. They will, they will, change their patches. I mean, they will get the sounds. This is for, this is a podcast for drummers. I don't care about guitar players. This no, but I'm saying, I'm saying that's, that's where when people are sitting in the audience, that's where the, the authenticity of the song comes from. It's not coming from me. I just, now that said, all, all my drums are tuned very sort of average. I mean, it's, it's not a particularly high cracky snare. It's not a particularly low. The toms aren't, you know, too dead. They're not too boomy. It's a very, they're sounds that, that, can go either way. There's a lot of latitude. It's not, they're not tuned such that they're so far to one direction that they just don't work at all on these songs. They work on every song well enough. If need be, the, the front of house guy will put a little length on the snare or whatever. I mean, he'll, he'll, make, he'll do some EQ things, but never ever a trigger, not on my drums. I do have a, a pad, a sample pad uh, with a foot pedal, so I'll play tambourine back, you know, backing. I'll do certain hits. Depending on the song, there may be conga parts that I'll, I'll physically play on this pad. Now, the way we get the rest of the, the sounds, I mean, we make a lot of noise. There's five of us on stage. Al's got a MIDI accordion, so he can make a lot of sounds. Uh, we also, on a lot of the sound, uh, songs we do, there's video running because it's a, it's a multimedia. It's a multimedia comedy and rock extravaganza. I don't know. Great rock and, right, it's a, You know, this great long title. Great title. And, and there's always something going on. We do costume changes. It's like a Broadway show, but it's like a rock and roll Broadway show. And it's two hours of like, or an hour and a half or whatever, of just nonstop. You know, even when we're back doing a costume change, there's stuff going on on the screen. And people just sit there and they're just bombarded with stuff. So while a lot of these videos are running, there's also a track on the video that's got, the, that flies in sometimes uh, extra vocals. It may fly in some horn parts. It may fly in percussion parts that, I mean, I just can't physically play. Uh, for example, uh, in Word Crimes, our parody of Blurred Lines, there's, it's a very straight beat. It's like a, it's like a two bar loop for the entire song, right. period. And, but there's this whole percussion, ricky ticky thing going on. There's two different cowbells. There's little cloth, there's wood that block thing. That inside of the lawsuit, right? Yeah, there's, there's that, that whole stuff going on. That's coming in, when we play it live, that's coming in off the, the server. That's running with the video for the song. And what's cool about that is, and I think, I, I, don't, I don't remember, God, I, I'm the only one that hears the click, but whatever that click is, I'm also getting that little percussion track. So I'm playing along to that, that constant 16th, you know, eighth note thing going on, just blasting in my head. And I love that because it's just, it's like playing with these three other percussionists on stage. You know, but it's only, you know, and it goes out to the house, but I mean, that's what I'm playing to. That's like mostly my click, which makes it really easy. I don't play to a TikTok, TikTok. I play to a drum pattern. Sometimes on some of these songs, I actually have the original song just playing in my head. I mean, I hear it. I hear my drums. I want to hear Al's vocals. And I actually play to the track and vocals are on the track. I mean, that's how I do some of these songs. It just depends. Other songs, I, I actually cook up my own uh, click with my own count off. Mm -hmm. So I get a count off to do a count off so the guys can hear me. And then we go and I just, I'm the only one that hears that thing and they play to me, I assume. Everyone says we sound good, so. They're, that they're supposed must work. to you anyway. So, yeah. well, yeah. All right, so you guys are doing, you're using back track. That's, I mean, incredibly common. Everybody's using tracks nowadays. Um, almost everybody that I know is using tracks. I use it on probably 80% of the gigs that I do too. Um, but it's always something different. Usually there's a straight click, it's never, it's never anything percussive. It's usually just something really annoying. Like the gen, I have the generic Pro Tools beep memorized. Oh. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, but you're right. When you have it sounding like there's three other percussionists with you, and those percussionists can't screw up because they're not real. Um, oh yeah. It makes it way, way, way easier. Yeah. What I've started getting into recently, and I mean only in the last couple of years, maybe. Some people will have vocal cues on their backing tracks also. So yeah. I don't know if you have that at all, but that's been like, 
a giant safety net when I'm like in the middle of a song and I'm totally ignoring what's going on because I'm too busy, you know, trying to twirl my sticks and show off or something. And then all of a sudden you get a voice that's like the bass player, keyboard player coming in going, verse, one, <laughs> one two. And then I'm like, oh yeah, switch to this part, you know? So I don't know if you've ever done that before. Will you actually have a vocal cue in there? No, no. The we just, we just know, we know the songs, you know, we, okay. we, uh, you know, some, some of these songs have been drilled in our heads for, for 30, 35 years. I mean, well, there's just, there's no, there's no forgetting them. Yeah, that I wouldn't think so at all. But it's um, having the vocal cues has actually been something that's made it so mm. I don't have to memorize the song anymore. The first time I ever had it, though, it scared me because I was like, who's that? Yeah, I, <laughs> that'd be weird to be playing along and just hear this voice in your head. Right. No, look at the bass player, I, like, he's, my power went out. Wow. Hang on, I'm, we're still, it's still on. Hang on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back now. I'm at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, I've been there before. It's lovely. Played, played uh, there several times. My, uh, my light just kind of went out on me. I don't know why. I got a very, uh, I was using a ring light, and it's, it's very temperamental. I mean, like, a, you could blow on it, and it turns off for whatever reason. Maybe I just had uh, it on too long. So now I got to deal with this crappy overhead light but we can that's okay it's it's real that's okay it's, it's manageable it's, it's yeah it's so. like it's live tv right. but you know i i i you know the cues we have we don't really have cues we just hear the songs we we know these songs now, i listen to al's vocal just not that i don't know where i'm at in the song but it's just easier for me to to sort of hear it you know and it's not like i'm trying to listen to a mix i mean i have a very we all have very odd mixes that um, we have i i mine is very much a need to know mix if i don't have to hear the keyboard on a song if there's not a cue that I'm taking from him rhythmically or, or you know, part what I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear clutter. I want to hear if I'm if I'm on a click, I want to hear the click. I want to maybe hear the guitar player. If we're not on a click, I probably want to hear the guitar player, you know, some bass. But it's it's, you know, I'm up there to do do the song, not to I don't want to say I don't enjoy it, but I'm not up there to like listen to the band play and, and enjoy a mix of that performance. I'm up there to deliver the performance. and. So I make sure the click is one that I can follow. I mean, I've never, ever, ever lost the click because I have clicks that I can work with. And I, and I don't like that TikTok business. I like a drum part and I'll just put in a regular drum part. And I don't make a fancy drum part so that I can play in and out of it. If there's another drummer playing in my head, playing straight time, I can play to it. You know, if there's a click, I just sort of, that, that becomes really annoying. And it's not, it's not as fun, a lot more fun playing with another drummer or in the word crime song, you know, percussionists yeah. you know it's just that's that. and that that's part of what makes it fun for me but that's also a huge part of why i can stay on the click and it's important to stay on the click not that we can't stray from the click but the video's running so there's like video things happening and there's certain things that are obviously go in time with the music and if we're not right on it i mean you know maybe i get a 30 second note off but not even a 16th i mean i'm i'm, I'm right on it i don't want to brag but i've been working with the click live since 85 and in the studio since 84 and and i just i know the drill with a click i know how to work with a click and and uh, and i wonder sometimes if if drummers don't like a click they have all these excuses oh music has to breathe oh it has to oh i i you know I, my time is good i well then then work with a click you know you're, you're saying all that stuff because you can't work with a click your time is not that good you know music you can have feel without it you know having to to move you know, sometimes some music does, a lot of music doesn't. I don't mean just dance stuff, but I mean live music. I mean, back in the, that's, I'm going to date both of us now, back in the 70s <laughs> with Steely Dan and Frank Zappa and a lot of those kind of artists and a lot of the fusion artists that were starting to come up, you know, they would do stuff and we would marvel at how perfect the time was and how tight they were. And we just, we, we loved that. They weren't playing to a click. Now they could play. But this notion of, of, you know, things can be a little loose and they have to breathe and there's some pushing and pulling that goes on. Not for those guys. Tell that to Steely Dan, to what's left of Steely Dan. Yeah. Good luck getting a gig with them if you think music has to flow like that. Right. Uh, there's a lot of guys that you would never be able to, you would never be able to do a gig with Al. If, if somebody can't work with the click, that'd be the first question. If I ever get replaced, first question is going to be, are you are you extremely comfortable with a click? Do you have a problem at all in any way, shape, or form playing with a click? 
And if they say, you know, I'd really rather not, my time's really good. I really don't want to work with the collective. Say, okay, thank you. Goodbye. And the first question I get asked always from anybody who's looking to hire me, first question out of the gate, can you play to a click? And um, I've, I've even gotten jobs where people are like, well, our previous drummer couldn't play to the click, so we needed somebody else. And like you said, every excuse in the book and what it is, is it's an excuse. If you can play to the yeah. click, then you know how to organically push and pull without straying too far while using a click. Like if you know how yeah. to use it, you know how to use it and you'll be fine. To, to say that it's too restricting I see is just a nonsensical excuse. And I, where I get that excuse most, honest to God, is guitar players, where I've had that several times and I've even lost gigs because I insisted on playing to a click and they refused. And it was really because where did you go? You're at Red Rocks? <laughs> I'm at Red Rocks. How about that? You're, I'm you're sorry. The, I just the travel I'm right just, now. Yeah, um, this, it's like my own little tour. I'm going to the venues that we played. Uh, we might go to Meadowbrook in New Hampshire next. Who knows? Oh, wow. As long as the weather's... Hard, hard to say. Um, Sorry. No, that's I, I digressed. It's not good. I, um, the background surprised me. Um, I love it. Uh, yeah, no, I, like I've had people, you know, they've called me up and say, we, we don't want you to play to a click kind of thing because they felt it was too restricting. And what it really turned out was when I'm counting them in, they couldn't play to my count in at all and um you know that and obviously it's always the drummer that's wrong so it always oh, makes of course. the drummer look like he's screwing up on stage where if anybody really listened i'm here and he's all over the place um so it, it's like you said i always felt like it was a super super uh huge uh excuse of you know, the, the click is too restricting. And I had act, someone we both played for, actually, get this. Uh -oh. we, uh -oh. So you and I both played for, uh, what was his name, Don? Uh, oh, yes, Don Haney. Don Haney, Don Haney, all right. That's right, that's right, right. yeah. So you and I have both played for this guy. I toured <laughs> with him for about six weeks uh, on a blues tour we played years ago, maybe 20... Uh 14 or something like that. I, I, I remember, I remember we talked about that. Right. Okay. And that's so, all I'll, I'll, that's all I'll say. He was the one, yeah, we don't need to talk about how that tour. Yeah. Ended, but <laughs> he was the one who said that he was totally against the click. He said he had a, had a bad experience with a drummer who tried to play to a click and he was just totally against it. And I said, you know what, you're the boss. We're out here on the road. Fine. Yep. But I did it anyway without telling him. I had a little, I had a pad set up next to my hi-hat that was, yeah. um, like a trigger pad hooked up to the the click and i run in ears and i got a mixer next to me and stuff like that so he would start off the songs most of the time right if it was a song i was starting it was fine i could turn the click on and just start but it, he was starting the song with on guitar solo or something then um as he starts playing the intro i would start tapping that pad and it would set my click and then i just hit play right before I come in and the click was yeah. going in my ear and then I would jump in right at the tempo he had just been playing at and I'd run through the entire song. It took him about a week into the tour to figure this out. And you know, he came up, he came up to me backstage one night and he shook my hand. He goes, I like how you play to that click. And after that, he was sold. Oh. The whole first week of the tour, I was doing it on stage every night without him knowing because he was so against it. And I was like, there's no way I, you know, I'm, I don't know these songs. They didn't prep me at all. Honest to God, the first time I heard the songs was when I was counting us in the first night of the tour, because there was no rehearsal. They flew me from LA to South Dakota to meet with everybody. And two days later we were on the road and they told me we, you know, we do a mix of uh, we're doing two or three sets a night doing a mix of original songs and covers. And they said, don't learn any of the covers because we do our own versions of them. And I can't learn any of his songs because he didn't have anything recorded. So I just had to feel it. And it took me about two or three days to figure out what I was doing on the songs. But I was like, there's no way I'm going in that blind without at least having a click running in my ear to like make sure I don't completely 
drive us into a wall at some point because I don't know what's coming next. At least I'll know where the timing is and I can keep two and four if all else fails. Yeah. <laughs> So no, it's that's that's part of the key. I mean, you have to know how to work with a click, and it's not. It, yeah, it is about staying on the click, but it is about what happens if you stray just a little bit, and now you start hearing you're flaming with the click. How much do you correct? How much? How far away do you get before now you're overcorrecting? And then that's when it becomes a problem. Is when you overcorrect, and there's all of us, and people start following you a little bit, and now you have to come back to the click. That's where the train wreck is. Right. You know, if you know if you know how to adjust. I mean, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm saying I've never lost the click. I've never gotten so far away that we've had a train wreck, and and that's because I know how to. If I get off, I don't panic and and you know, or I don't let it get too far that I can't, you know, massage it and nobody i'm the only one that knows are you are you the one on stage running the tracks or do you have it you have somebody else doing that you have a tech doing that we, yeah we have we have uh i mean there's a guy that runs the the server okay and and uh and uh you know handles all of that and handles you know sometimes there's some cues there's sometimes there's a video cue that flies in mm -hmm. you know so there needs to be somebody who does that i mean i'm not just doing that on, on my end and it's a very uh, redundant computer like they're using Mac Pro major rack things and there's two of them and they do all this stuff and uh, you know I mean they're they're running high def video and you know uh, high def audio which is really not necessary in a in a yeah. live situation but they do it that's just how Al programmed it so they get really get taxed it took us a long time we went through a whole series of servers that had uh, that pretended to be video servers and they were just terrible because we just taxed the hell out of them one of them we literally had three screens three high def screens going of content different content uh you know to make up one big you know they used to call it cinerama right but yeah. to make up one big giant long screen we had three high def programs running on that plus audio plus several channels of audio i mean al gets a cue i get a cue uh and then there's stereo to the house so there's four channels of of uh you know high def audio at the same time and that really taxed these machines. It didn't get straightened out at all until eventually, you know, the guy who ran all that stuff says, you know, I think you it's time to move up to, you know, a computer solution rather than these devices that are made, you know, that are 10 years behind the times. You know, 360 systems and stuff like that had stuff that wasn't really up to what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, but we finally got it squared away and, and have stuck with those things. And I don't know that we've ever had a crash. I mean, it's been... Uh, it's been very reliable, but there is a dedicated person who just runs that. Now, we did a tour a couple of years ago <clears throat> called the Ill-Advised Vanity Tour. And this was us, no costumes, no video, no tracks, no nothing. It was just us on stage playing mostly our originals. And we did a different set every night. We had like 50 or so originals that we rotated through, uh, you know, a 77-date tour. There were, uh, Al made up the set list so that no two set lists were alike. So wow. the fans, the fans would post a set. Oh, he's he's playing these songs, and then you know the first show would get posted online, and then people would come back thinking they were going to see that show, and it was a whole different show. And it took him about a week to figure out what was going on, and it took him about a month to finally hear all of the to to know what all of the songs were in the rotation. But they never knew what the set was. And we did one other cool thing: we did uh, just a straight original song, a, a, a straight cover, uh, "Smoke on the Water." I saw her standing there, "Honky Tonk Woman." Stuck oh. in the Middle with You, uh, uh, some Elton John, Crocodile Rock, I think we did. Uh, 77 of those, <laughs> 77 songs that, that we oh. had to learn to play, to play one time. Wow. Now, so we, now we didn't learn them prior to the tour. We learned three of the songs prior to going on the road and, and did those. And as we got into, you know, one, since we were doing a different set every night, we would very often have to do like a rehearsal sound check. Sometimes it was a couple of hours. Sometimes the sound check was longer than the show because we had to go through some of these songs and work on the, the cover that we were going to do that night. Uh, and then and that happened every day throughout the entire tour. We would always do two, two, you know, some of the songs in the afternoon. Okay, we're doing this tonight and this and this. Is, anyone want to go over these? Yes, no. Okay. okay, now let's go over tonight's cover and let's go over tomorrow night's cover. And every day we had a show, we went over that night's song and the next show's song. So we always did two covers to, to rehearse them. So basically every song that we, every cover song we did got played, you know, a couple of times the day before and then the day of the show, you know, the afternoon of the show. And then we would play it at the show. And then that was it. Uh, gone forever. Wow. So it's so, so much work for just like, here's four minutes. <laughs> 
uh, yeah. So it was, and that was that was really really cool because the fans didn't know what was coming, and they just they loved it. They loved it. Yeah. <laughs> no, we were so on this on this tour that we did, and, and it was a great, and it was literally, and again, no tracks, no nothing, uh, no clicks. You know, no, now what I did do <clears throat> is is I kept a I keep a, a iPad with a touch like a metronome on it, mm -hmm. and I would have on some of the songs that I started that I counted off. I would key in the tempo of the song uh, just so I'd have a starting place. I didn't follow it as a click, but I just it would give me the correct count off so that nobody could say, oh, you started that off too fast or too slow. Like, no, it started at 187 and maybe, you know, well, it was really fast. I said, well, I probably ended up at 182, so shut up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I gave, I, gave us all a break by slowing it down a little. Uh, the, the Pro <laughs> app has been a lifesaver and like, even at times where you wouldn't think you would need to use a click, I always like having that safety blanket there. Like um, these, uh, you know, these jam nights they have in town, the sunset jam, the ultimate jam night, stuff like that. So I go out and I play those all the time. And like, you're getting up and you're doing maybe one or two songs a night and that's it. And I, I always have the pro metronome running in my back pocket, ears in cable running down my back, you know, so no one knows. I get up on stage and oh, there we go, and I and I play it to the click. It's just a safety net because those are unrehearsed songs. You don't often know even who you're going to be on stage with until the day of. Um, usually, it's a couple days before, like one or two days before, they even tell you what songs they want you to learn. So, you know, it's it's the whole point is supposed to be unrehearsed on the fly, just showcasing how good these musicians are that they can just pick it up like that. So a lot of the time I'm like, I just need at least that safety net to keep me on track. So I know my part. And if the keyboard player or the bass player, somebody goes wildly off the handle somewhere, I know at least it wasn't me that train wrecked us. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, that's happened before, too. And I've been in a situation like that, too, like you said, where, like, oh, wow, it felt really fast. And I'm like, no, nah, it's the same as it was last night. <laughs> well, there's, there's that, too. I mean, it, yeah. you know, and it, and it keeps us honest because, you know, we can have different concepts, you know, depending how we feel, you know, depending where in the set a song is, depending how tired or, or, or hyper we are that day. I mean, that can affect us, our, our perception of it, too. So it keeps us honest as well to be able to say, you know, no, this is where... I wouldn't have thought it was there, but it's there. The number is right, so that is the right tempo, regardless what's up here, regardless what the guys think. That's yeah. really it, because the audience can tell. They, they they know. What do you use for a for a metronome app? So, uh, like on my phone, I just have Pro Metronome. Uh, there's a free version and there's a paid version. Um, the the paid version just allows you to do like subdivisions and stuff like that. Um, and the cool thing is it's transferable. <laughs> and I'm, this is not. I'm not like not a paid endorsement for this app company or nothing like that. Uh, I've been using this app since it first launched, however many years ago. And every phone I've upgraded to along the way, I just re-download it. And if you bought it once, if you did the paid version, which is only like four bucks, if you bought it once, you can, uh, any new device you get, when you download it, you can hit restore and it gives you that paid version. So I spent $4 oh, cool. on this app probably eight years ago. And I always have it with me. So I got it on my phone. <coughs> I use it with my students. I have, I use my old phone. Um, I have like an old phone that I use as a, uh, basically like a uh, MP3 player kind of thing. I deleted all the apps. I cleared all the data, everything off of it. Factory reset it and just downloaded the metronome and the music player. And that's it. And I use that to run backing tracks sometimes even. Um, or sometimes if I just need the click, I'll use that. Um, on stage, I, I like to have a physical metronome because the app could crash, your battery could die, the, like anything yeah. could happen. Um, the phone could fall and comes unplugged, something. So on stage, I like to have a physical metronome that I actually have to plug into a wall. And... Um, I have two rigs. I have an A rig and a B rig for live stuff. And the, the A rig, um, it's a big metal <coughs> case that's got a 10 channel mixer. Um, and it's all like hardwired with like dividers and padding and stuff like that to a 
Yamaha uh, DT. Sorry, you're you're frozen. You're, oh. you're, you're you look like that. There, you're back. Okay. Well, no, I'm holding my hands like that, so it's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all good. <laughs> but I probably did glitch and freeze. It said my internet connection was slow. But um, <laughs> so that's all wired to like an old Yamaha DTX brain. And that's yeah. plugged into like channel one on that 10 channel mixer. And then all the other channels are for my ears. And that's, that's the big rig. If I need a bunch of multiple inputs for my, my in-ears, if we're running tracks and the live band and electronic drum pads and all this other stuff. And then the smaller rig, the B rig, that's actually gets more use than anything else. It's about this big. It's in a little coffin case. Um, actually it's right here and, uh, <coughs> this thing, it's a drumstick case. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. And what I did is I took the liner out on the, on the bottom half. I put a little five channel mixer and a Tama rhythm watch in there. And nice. all I do is I set this next to me, open it up. They're already plugged into each other. And I just take the cables out. There's a little, um, uh, extension cable in here. They're plugged into that. I just take the cable up, plug it in, done. And on the mixer, what I'll do, uh, one channel is, is the click. And I like the rhythm watch because I can just spin the dial, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then um, the other channels are reserved for the live band. You know, I'll take a feed of the live band in so that way I can independently mix everything and I'll take a feed of the tracks in and stuff. And I can create my own monitor mix. And um, I, like you, I have a, a, an independent, weird, oddball mix in my ears that no one else in the world would ever want to hear. Yeah. It's usually bass guitar, super hot, kick, snare, maybe a little bit of the toms and the hats, um, and then a little guitar and even less of the vocals. I like as little guitar and vocals in my mix as possible. I like the vocalist just loud enough that I can hear the melody they're singing, but I don't necessarily need to hear the words or nothing like that. I don't, I don't know the lyrics to any songs that I play. You know what I mean? And um, cause I'm not paying attention to that. I want to just sit and play off the bassist. You know, if there's a keyboard player, I like them kind of tucked underneath the drums too, but yeah still louder than the guitar and the, the singer always. Um, that's just what I got used to. And then the click obviously is at the top too. Yeah. Now the reason I asked about a metronome though was, was uh, and, and especially as an app, there's <clears throat> when on, on this last tour is the first time at the last tour on, on the 2018, this, this, uh, the uh, no frills tour as, as we called it, uh, where we just were playing and, and that was it. No clicks, no nothing. Uh, in, in order, first off, because we were playing songs that we didn't, we weren't going to be playing that often. And some songs, I mean, some of these originals we haven't played since we recorded them. I mean, maybe in some cases we've never even played these as a band. Now we, we had rehearsed this stuff, obviously, but, you know, just sort of to go through and get some basic arrangements. And then we were expected to kind of tidy them up before the first date of the tour. But as, as we went through, uh, we would, we would, uh, where was I going with this? I would have to, uh, metronome. Well, it's the first time, first, no, it's the first time we, that I've, I've used a, a metronome on stage, but it's also the first time we all had charts. We've never had charts before. So I had an iPad that had, you know, the PDFs of the charts that I had written for this. In some cases, the original songs that we had recorded, I'd gone, I kept all of my charts from 30, 40 years ago. And, and I would go through and I would use those, or I'd write a new chart if, if need be, whatever it was. But I would go through and I would, until I got them in my head, because some of these things we played once or twice on that iPad, I have, and I have it on my phone. I have, yeah, what's, it, let me see. It's, it's, see. there we go. Looks like a kiss. Right. So you punch in, I don't have to scroll or do anything. I can literally punch in, you know, the song is, uh, is uh, 80, got it. You know, and I just press go and it's, so I can do that on the fly. I don't have to dial and have it, you know, increment up or down. And on the iPad, of course, it's, it's this big. So it's really great. I can reach over and I can program a new tempo in about two seconds. The problem is they don't have this app anymore. I'm surprised it even runs on this iPhone uh, and you can't get a new one now, happily. And in fact, my old iPad is little more than a metronome anymore for that app. I had this physical beat lab, which I think was Korg uh, made that. And it had a keypad on it as well, 
so I could just punch in the thing and press go rather than try and scroll and then you scroll past the number and they're waiting for you to start the song and I'm trying to scroll from 94 beats a minute to 131 beats a minute and they're kind of, come on well you count it off already so this way I can just hit three buttons and then hit a fourth button and it, and it goes again just to give me a count off not to play to it through the song in fact I don't I don't even hear it it's just I just use the flash uh, mode on it so I can just see the flashes in there and you know that's within a beat or two per minute. That's certainly close enough. Yeah. You know, a completely on the fly song, but that gives me the start to be able to count it off. Yeah. And write count offs. And, and that was the only way to do that. That's when I got in to start using that. That's when I got that beat lab. That was before I, for me. so, but I, I do like the concept. So when I asked about what, what app you were using or what Metro, you know, if, if it's got a keypad on it, and yes. if it goes on a phone or a device, that's okay. That's something I probably need to look into because I need, I'm going to need to put that on a new device someday. Yeah. Where's my phone here? I can pull it up real quick. It, it does have a keypad on there, but here's the funny thing. I've been using this thing for years and I didn't know it had a keypad. One of my students showed me. Because uh, these kids, these kids, I'm telling you. They're much more tech savvy than I am where I'm like, it's got a wheel and I can spin it. Right. So it looks like that right there. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, um, all I got to do to get the, um, to, to get what I want is tap the tempo, the number up there and then yeah. keep that. Oh, and I just can do it and you hit set so I can go, okay. Uh, 125. And then I just hit, you know, set. Yep. And it changed it to 125. Um, oh, okay. The other cool thing, it does have a flash mode. So if you want it to flash at you, I've never used that because I always thought it'd be weird on stage to have this light flashing at me the whole time. Um, but I like the fact that you have subdivisions on there. And yeah. you, again, you, you have to pay to get the subdivisions, but there's a way to cheat it. If you want the eighth note, you can adjust the independent volumes of each beat. So what you do is you make one and three, one volume, you make two and four a separate volume and then double the tempo. So that's right. how I get my students to cheat it. If when they download the free version and I want them to play something at 50, I'm like, okay, put it at 100, we'll cheat it. I thought you were going to tell me there's a way to save four bucks because I'm I'm down with that. <laughs> well, yeah, there. That's how you do it. Um, you can't get triple. Four bucks is four bucks, you know. But um, uh, but I I paid for it. I paid the four bucks for it just because it was easier to just click a button, you know, click the quarter note, and then I can change it to an eighth note if I want. Because I'll anything that's usually slower, like slower than a hundred beats per minute. I tend to make my click count eighth notes if it's a straight time yeah. thing. Just yeah. eat up that dead space in the middle right. to keep me right. a little bit more on track so I don't push and pull too far off of it. Yeah. Um, but anything over that, and it's that would be too much, so then you keep it at quarter notes kind of deal. And it's funny that you mentioned you guys were using charts on stage. Um, I Well, I suppose if you're going to play a song once and once only, that would be... That, that's nice to be able to have that option. I'm glad that you, you were allowed to do that. I, well, we, everyone had them. I mean, Al, Al had, I mean, everyone, oh, really? we've, never, we've never done that before. We've never had to do that. Wow. And, and, and this time it was like, there's no other way. You know, Al, just so you know, we're going to have charts on stage. And okay. he says, yeah, no, I, I get it. I understand. And, and really on a lot of these, these cover songs we did, a lot of them, uh, we just, we know, we didn't have charts for I Saw Her Standing There. I mean, we, we all grew up with that. We all know that. Yeah. You know, there's certain songs, Honky Tonk Woman. I mean, we did not need charts for that. That's got a built-in ending. Uh, you know, songs that have a built-in arrangement, you know, and that we grew up with and that we played in bars a thousand times. We don't need to, you know, had we played Mustang Sally, we all would have known that, you know, for example. Uh, so, you, so, but there was... Cam camouflage the charts at all? Or just... Nope, no. Didn't, no. No, it's, you know, uh, that's, just, that's just how it is. You know, there's a lot of guys, there's a lot of bands on stage that, that use charts. They have an iPad. I mean, they don't disguise them at all. I mean, there'll be a singer up front and she'll have a little holder on her mic stand or his mic stand. And it's got very obviously got an iPad on. You can see it reflecting on them. I mean, it's I, not a secret. I mean, I see bands doing that in bars and stuff all the time. And I got to be honest, I hate seeing an iPad on a mic stand. I like, for whatever reason, that bothers me. But I, I know that people have been doing stuff like that forever. Um, 
you know, but a lot of time it was always disguised as like floor wedges or something like that. You oh, right. You, yeah, yeah, teleprompters, yeah. The teleprompters looked like they were floor monitors. And so from the audience perspective, you never knew that Ozzy's looking down, reading the lyrics. And um, so I was wondering if you disguised it at all. I keep mine, like I keep a small music stand low underneath my hi-hat with a little book light, you know, gaff tape yeah. to it. And so no one knows that I'm using them. From the audience perspective, you don't see it at all. It's camouflage. No one's looking at my left knee. So I keep it down there just to make it less obvious. And some people go to extremes. I've got a, I got a friend, do you know, um, I'm trying to get him on the show too. He said he wants to wait and watch a couple episodes first because he, don't let him see this one <laughs> yeah, he's afraid that you know he and i won't ever get hired again because our conversation might be too casual um uh but uh, he's got a a drum looks like a drum right next to him and i i went and saw him play one night and i kept staring at it. he never once hit it and it was like the only drum that wasn't the same color as the rest of the kit and i'm like <laughs> what is that thing next to your hi-hat man and like I just the whole night I was puzzled by it. And then after the show, he's like, come here, I got to show you something. And as we're walking to the kit, I'm like, what was that? What's that weird drum next to your hats you never hit? And he's like, that's what I'm going to show you. It was an iPad. It oh, was wow. um, and the heads cut out and there's an iPad mounted inside of it. Wow. So it looks like it's just another drum on the kit but it's got his iPad on there. And he, all he's got to do is remember to not turn and whack it. <laughs> wow. Well, we do, I, no, we, we don't, we don't really go, no, we're not, you know, I, I mean, the guys have like a music stand, you know, it's just, it's okay. not a secret. It's not a big secret. That's again, it's the first time we did that. We didn't do it last year. I mean, because we, we, you know, we're playing a, a straight set every night and we knew what we were doing. But in this one year we did that. And yes, Al did use teleprompters. And if anyone was paying attention, they would have uh, said, Al's wearing in-ears. Why, why would he need monitors? Right. So if, if uh, you know, some of the musicians out there probably figured it out pretty quickly. But that was done because we were doing so many different songs for the same reason we used charts. You know, and again, these are songs that he wrote, but that's, you know, 50 different songs. You know, and, and, and a different set every night. You don't have a chance to really learn a set of songs. He had to have, in his defense, you know, to his credit, I, I don't think he ever used, uh, not that I know of, I don't think he ever had to refer to the monitors and, and uh, to the monitors, to the teleprompters. Right, right. And, and, I, and I know that because sometimes I'd hear him sing a wrong lyric. So he was definitely not looking at it. But I never, I never heard him lose his place or completely jump a verse or you know or change the arrangement on a song or something like that he's he knows that stuff very very well and uh it's a nice it's nice to have that kind of fail safe there for you but you know and frankly you know when i'd have a chart that i was playing to you know i wasn't sitting there just reading the chart i mean i was i would refer to it now what was a lot of a lot of fun is if the chart went over two or three pages and you could only see one at a time at some point i'd have to i'd have to find the right spot to reach over and, and, you know, and I tried to hook up a foot pedal, but it wouldn't do it because my iPad was so old. I mean, it's the original iPad too, that the, the cool foot pedal that everyone uses wouldn't work with it. So I couldn't, I couldn't even use that. So, do you, I mean, you would, you're at least using an iPad where you can swipe it or something like that. I don't yeah. have an iPad. I don't, I don't do that. It's, I still old school, like give me a Sharpie and I sit at my dining room table. <laughs> listen to the song, stop, repeat it on iTunes, make sure I got the part right. Okay, that was eight bars. And I, I use a Sharpie and chart it that way. Um, and then I use colored highlighters and I color code. The verses are blue, the choruses are yellow. And I just basically highlight numbers. You know, the eight, the 16, the 12, whatever it is, however many bars it is, whatever the bar, bar count is. Mm -hmm. Intros are green, bridges are orange, solos are pink and those glow underneath stage lights oh nice so that's kind of the buffalo sharpie system like they have the nashville number system nashville yours is the sharpie buffalo sharpie. sharpie system right yeah so i'll do that but like you said where you have something that goes over a couple of pages if you got the foot pedal you can step on or whatever i'm still doing paper 
and I had a gig that started last fall and it was a weekly gig with a buddy of mine. There was one song we were playing every Wednesday <laughs> and I got the call literally on a Sunday and he's like, Hey, are you available this Wednesday? I can be, what do you want me to do? And it was like, learn a bunch of Doors songs kind of thing. Learn an entire set of Doors material. And I'm like, well, all right, challenge accepted. So I went and I made charts and stuff like that, but I actually found some pre-written charts to a couple of the songs. And I was like, these look close enough. I'm only using them to, like you said, to glance at anyway. One of them was like five pages long. <laughs> And I had it printed out in a binder underneath my hi hat, and I'm playing, and I'm like, and like, I there was, you know, and I didn't even know it was going to be like a regular gig at the time. I thought it was a one time deal, so I stressed over these charts to get them right. And then after that night, he's like, "See you next Wednesday." And I was like, "We're doing what?" Like, so, and it became a regular gig right up until you know, right up until COVID. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, trying to flip that page, you know, like that and, and get through a song that's like seven minutes long and yeah. it's incredibly monotonous because it's got three minutes of it's just a keyboard solo and you're trying to flip the page and, you know. Uh, well, yeah. we're, we're notorious for having some long songs, for having some epic songs, which yeah. we would do, you know, on, on this tour. You know, we have a, a song that's 11, 12 minutes long. And it's at break, it's at like 190. So I had, first off, I, I slowed it. Everyone says it's too fast. I said, it's record tempo. I got it right here. I promise you we're starting it at record tempo. Well, it's, it's too fast. Said, and I'm slowing it down. You know, fine, I'll start it slower. But, you know, this is what we did on the record. Well, it's 12 minutes long. I said, it was 12 minutes on the record. Well, yeah, but we punched it in. I said, that's not my fault. You know, so. Anyway, so I think I slowed it down to 185, and it probably massaged a little bit, you know, slower than that, you know, over the course of the song. And it was cer certainly plenty fast for everybody. Nobody said, oh, it's feeling lazy. It's like, yeah, it's still, it's pretty peppy, but, you know, we got it. We'll yeah, be all right. It's sweating, you know, two and a half minutes into it, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, uh. It's a fan. It's at 190. It's that 12 minutes oh, it's, long of something that upbeat. <laughs> yeah. It's with, with very few, like there's a stop here and there. Like there's one stop about eight minutes into the song, you know, that's just sort of a, a you know, rubato, you know, till I bring it back in. And I get about three seconds to just catch my breath. And then I have to come back. Da, 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 and, <laughs> it's, it's for anybody that's listening and, and maybe knows our catalog. It's Albuquerque, okay. which when we do it in concert, it's longer. I think Albuquerque is 11 minutes on the record. It's about 13 minutes when we do it in concert, which when we would do that song in, in a show that night, uh, that replaced like three songs. So we would always yeah. see a set. We'd oh, see a set list that, that was a little bit shorter. And it's like oh, a couple of these are going to be long songs. You know, it's, yeah. it's uh, and, and we would, you know, now he learned also to not put that at the end of the set when we had already played and we were already tired. We we yeah. would try to get that out of the way early. Yeah, that's and, good. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, adventures on tour. You know, that's wow. That's one of the, the occupational hazard. You record a song and you have to play it the same way. And that's just, that's why we get, the, that's why I got a mug. You I, know? I'm sure we've all been in, in situations where you're, tracking something in the studio and you're like, I, I don't want to play this live. <laughs> I want to be done with it after today. <laughs> well, there's a bunch of stuff that, that we did uh, in the studio. And I, and I guess if, I, if I'd anticipated, in some cases, anticipated playing it live, I would have maybe done something different. Like there was a song, we did a marching song called, uh, uh, it's, it was on the last album. I can't think of it. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, Oh, Al's going to kill me. Anyway, and I wrote this, a very nice kind of old school, you know, pseudo rudimental part, you know, and, and not, and, and a little bit random. I mean, it was all written out, but it was very, it didn't sound like the same part over and over, you know, until the, for eight or 12 or 16 bars. I mean, it, it had all sorts of different inflections going through it. And when it came time to do that live, which we did, with the orchestra in 2019, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden now uh, there's another, the snare drummer uh, is playing that along with me. So the sports song, 
and it's it's like a one minute song or two minute song and he's playing the parts and i don't know who orchestrated it but it wasn't i didn't write the drum parts for the orchestra so it wasn't quite like the part on, on the record which i went ahead and i printed that up and i had on my ipad i played exactly what was on the record and you know that i might not have done otherwise but now because there's someone else supposedly playing it anyway at some point we would tell the, those drummers that section i said don't do the snare part because you know bermuda's got the original music and you don't so yeah, it's gonna clash that, right so so that was that was one of those times where you know if i thought ahead i might i might have and it wouldn't have been any worse. It just would have been simpler knowing that I was going to reproduce that live someday. I never anticipated at the time that we were actually going to play that live because it's got horns and stuff in it. So it's like a marching band song. It's like, that's not, I don't even think there's a real bass guitar in it. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, that's just, in fact, I don't think anybody played on that but me and the orchestra now that I think about it. Oh, wow. That's... And... and uh you know, so it was, a, it was a, you know, so I never anticipated that we were going to play. And here we, we go out, we do a tour and it's like, oh, we're doing that song. It's like, okay, now I got to play the exact part and hope that the, the percussionist plays the exact part. And, you know, yeah, that was, I got to say playing with, and we had a different orchestra every night. Now we carried the conductor. We had a, a father and son conductor team. And I don't know why they switched off, but as long as we had one of them, they knew the show and they would work with the orchestra in the afternoon. We didn't rehearse with the orchestra. They would play uh, the set uh, as recorded early in the tour. So they would hear you know, us playing live, but we didn't have to sit there and, and go through everything. Al didn't have to strain his voice. I mean, we got out of sound checks basically by having the, the conductor rehearse the orchestra. So, <clears throat> and we had some good orchestras. And at Red Rocks, we had the Colorado Symphony, which was a great group, like 70 people in, uh, in Washington, D.C., or near D.C., we played Wolf Trap. We had the National Symphony. I mean, that's, you know, you see stuff for governmental uh, things like that, you know, and, and that's the group. I mean, that was like, there was 80 of them. Uh, you know, in Nashville, we had the Nashville Symphony Orchestra. You know, we had some good groups uh, throughout the country. And, and we had some groups that were in, in some of the smaller towns we would come through. Uh, you know, the, the, not in a big metro area, we would have like somebody's like community orchestra, and it'd be like, you know, 35 people that weren't really full-time players and, you know, they'd read and, and the conductors would get, you know, understandably frustrated with them because they had worked with some great, great orchestras and then they were working with some just sort of hobbyist kind of players. And I don't think we ever had any real train wrecks, but we could also tell, you know, when an orchestra wasn't right on it, we sort of, we knew it, we could feel it. And it didn't really change what we did because we were just playing the songs and not really paying much attention to what they did. But there were times where I had to play with them and had to hear them uh, in order to do that. And, and I could tell at that point, it's like, oh, they're, you know, these guys are on it. Like there'd be certain things that they just weren't up to speed on. Uh, the, the beginning of the show, we did a song called uh, Welcome to the Fun Zone. And it's pretty up-tempo, kind of rocking sort of a song. And if they weren't up to speed and a lot of kind of fast stuff for horn players and things like that, and I would always, and the conductor would try and pull them along and pull them along. And if they were really close to the real tempo, I would jump in at their tempo. I would, you know, if it was a little relaxed, I would do it. It was never, ever too fast, but it was rarely right on. It was always a little bit relaxed. If they were way slow, I would, I would let them have it. I would just, I would just come in with a really fast fill and, and they just like, <laughs> you know, they, it was just this jarring and they just, they had to do it. And God knows if, well, they didn't really always keep up, but I mean, sometimes they were just so far off. There was just no way to, to do it their way. Just you know, they had, little, they had to conform, you know. <laughs> yeah. but, but a lot of the orchestras were like, you know, if there was an orchestra that was right on, I knew it as soon as I came out and I, you know, heard them play and sat down and heard them, you know, in my ears and, and started playing with, I knew immediately that if it was a good group or a mediocre group and uh, Colorado symphony was a good group. They were a really good group, national symphony, really good group. And, uh, and pros, I mean, pros who had played together and play regularly and that's all they do. I mean, they are, and they've worked with pop and rock acts before, you know, this, you know, having to back a, a, a four or five piece, you know, rock group was not a big surprise to them. That, know, and, that's always been something that's been like on my <clears throat> list. My, my someday I want to cross that one off is play a rock show with a full orchestra. And, and it's not common, but a bunch of people have done it. You've done it. 
uh, Metallica has done it a oh, couple sure. times, stuff like that. And that was always one of those things that was like, man, that's got to be so cool. I like, I it was years before I even played in a band with like a horn player. I don't think I did that until probably seven or eight years ago for the first time, where I was like, hey, that's not a bass guitar or a, uh, over there, some that guy's holding a horn. Like, that was cool. Yeah. Um, but the orchestra is definitely like on the the bucket list of I like on a gigs to play it <clears throat> once, you know. I got I got to tell you how that started with us. It wasn't just this harebrained idea of Al's. We were doing in 2016, and we, we had two really good tours in 2015 and 2016. Busiest years of our lives, I might add. Well, we, had, we were coming off a number one album. Yeah, that's, which, that's right. Who has, no, who has number one album? So I guess everyone, every week, somebody does. But, you know, not, not us. I mean, we had a couple of top 10 albums, you know, on, on the Billboard chart, on the real chart, the 200. Uh, but that last album, and it was our last album, uh, was number one, debuted at number one. So, yep. Wow. I remember. Uh, and that was also the, I, I might add, it was the end of our contract with Sony. Oh, really? So yeah. Last it was one. like, yeah, number one album, see ya. <laughs> no, that had, no, that had already, we already knew that was, that fulfilled the contract and Al had already planned to, because the way records are selling, there's really no, there's no point, you know. I mean, our money is, is most bands' money is, is made touring. Yep. And, and uh, you know, certainly not making records. I mean, the records promote the tour rather than people see us live and decide they're going to go buy our catalog. That doesn't really, you know, they're listening to stuff on YouTube for free. And it's like, there's, there's only so much you can do about that. So the, uh, uh, when we played the Hollywood Bowl, we had two nights at the Hollywood Bowl. And it was during the summer and that's orchestra season. So their deal is if you're going to play our house, you have to have the orchestra play with you. You know, you can't just come in and, and not, you know, and cheat us out of a night's work, you know, as if they had symphonies booked every night, but that's not the, you know, so, so the, you know, we'll, we'll write the charts, but you have to hire us to play. If you want to play here, you have to hire us. We'll back you up. You know, we, we know the drill. We're pros. We, you know, we do this all the time, but that's what it's going to take. And it's like, well, okay. So they, they wrote the charts to the songs we were doing uh, that year, that tour. And, uh, you know, they, they sent sort of arrangements to Al so he would know kind of what to expect. You know, the keyboard player would sort of play the parts on a synth so he would know, you know, this is what you're going to hear on the song that didn't originally have strings or horns on it. This is what we're going to do. You know, is this, is this okay? Is this close? You know, and then the songs that did have those parts on them to begin with, you know, we will replicate those, of course. <clears throat> so we, we came in and we rehearsed with them, literally, this is the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra, for the first time, the, the afternoon of the first show, and we went went through the whole show with them, and they were stellar. They were they were fastidiously spot on, stellar, professional. We ran the whole show, and we were just like beaming. We were just like smiling, and just you know, you know, you, it was incredible. They they were just they were fabulous. And there were a couple of songs that they wanted to go over again. That their conductor wanted to go over again, uh, and and he he was placed to my left, so we were eye to eye. And and because there were certain, there were a couple of cues, and he had a track also. We were using tracks and videos on this tour. So there were certain things, and he knew what those were up front. So certain things, we both knew the cue. Certain things, he was gonna cue. Certain things, I was gonna cue, so he'd watch me. Certain things, Al was gonna cue, you know, with jumping up and coming down. So he would, so he had to learn which way to turn and who he was looking at for the cue. Or he was, I think he mostly just, relied on me because if I was with Al and he was with me and the orchestra was with him then we were all together and we were so in the in the rehearsal and that and that tour we did we have a couple of our Star Wars songs at the end and normally our keyboard player plays the st Star Wars march da, 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 or, or some you know whatever the, the theme is so the orchestra said just so you guys aren't surprised later you know, here's what we sound like doing this. And then you go into your, you know, your next song and they played it. And it was like listening in a theater. It was like listening to John Williams soundtrack. It was just, it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. So this, <clears throat> this tour, that show is what spawned the tour we did in 2019, the show in 2016. Al already had the concept for last year, three years ago. We didn't do it in 2018 because he already had the concept for that tour. We were going to take 2017 off. 2018 was going to be the No Frills Tour. 2019 would be the Strings Attached Tour. 
which for which I got a, a mug. Your mug. <laughs> Springs attached, a couple of couple of big bases on there. I love it. Uh, and uh, uh, and then uh, and then we'll see what the next tour brings. But anyway, that's what started this whole orchestral thing. Not to mention that you know we were not the only pop rock band to go out and do a tour with an uh, orchestra. Three Dog Nights done it. I mean, it, 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 yeah, Metallica. Everyone's done it. You know, to to various levels of success. And, you know, it's usually pretty cool. You know, nobody thinks it's going to be a classical show. They understand it's a rock show. Yeah. You know, they, and, and frankly, if you go back and you listen to, you know, if you listen to Tommy by The Who, you know, you got to understand that that's, you know, that's where that kind of all started. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, if it worked for them, if you like that, you're going to like, you know, yeah. this, doing it this way. So anyway. Yeah, no, I've always thought that was just such a cool idea, <clears throat> a cool concept. And when you said that you guys were doing that um, last year, I was like, that's, that's super awesome. I was just happy for you that you guys were going to do that. But I didn't realize it was like the L.A. Phil, like, you know, was mafioso strong arm and you play with our players. <laughs> well, not the L.A. Phil so much, although I'm sure there's some crossover well, in, the, in the members. Uh, but ho the Hollywood, the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra. Yeah. And 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 it was uh, that's just well, it's a union house. Yeah. And, and that's just that's their rule. And it's just and you want to play the bowl. And we did. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we did two nights at the bowl. Now we didn't, we didn't sell out either night, but we sold, I think we did like eight and a half thousand the first night at like 11,000 the next night, which is, Close you enough. know, bigger, much bigger than our usual venue, which is the Greek theater. We've been playing the Greek, like every tour since 1985. And we always, that's 55, 6,000 people, something like that. And we typically sell that out. And we also, we have, and we also did the Greek on this last tour. In fact, we did the Greek that year. And then did two nights at the Hollywood Bowl. Again, 2015 and 16 were big, big, big years for us. Yeah. Great years. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> and in 2019, we came back and we did uh, the Greek theater. And that was not an orchestra per se, but it was a bunch of pros that were put together. And I'm sure there were some L.A. Phil guys in there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that, was, that was a very cool, you know, those are all like major studio and live performing pros. That, that show, that, the Greek theater show was a stellar show. That was one of the great shows uh, of, of last year's tour as well. You know, plus the hometown gigs are always fun. But I mean, that was a special, a special yeah. one. And the Greek theater is always cool to play. It's always fun to play there. And uh, we also, for the first time, played the Greek theater up in, uh, uh, I guess it's in Berkeley, up near San Francisco. Oh, the, the, um, the other location that they had. The, 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 other, the other Greek. The, and the other and that was our first time. In fact, I'd never been there at all. And uh, what was cool about that was we stayed in Berkeley that afternoon and I, I ventured out, you know, I always like to, when I, especially when I'm in a new sound, uh, city, or if there's anywhere that's got cool stuff to see, I try and get out and I'll, I'll take a walk and I'll, or I'll take an Uber or whatever, and I'll go to my favorite drum shop or there's a record store I want to see or there's, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, there's, you know, there's an area town or there's a restaurant I want to go to, let's say. I mean, that's been the great thing about touring is as much as possible. I mean, I try to make it like a vacation. I mean, it's not. You know, even for the band, we, we have it pretty easy as players, but, or talent, as the crew calls us, uh, not, not always so sarcastically, but uh, no, we, we uh, uh, you know, have a lot more free time, obviously, than if we were on the crew. And I try and use that time wisely. And there's certain cities, I like to go out and do certain things in Toronto's a favorite city of mine, Vancouver's a favorite city, Calgary, uh, New York City, uh, Chicago. Uh, uh, I mean, there's uh, Seattle is great. Portland is, is a favorite place anywhere around San Francisco. Anyway, this is the first time we've been in Berkeley and I took that opportunity to go to the original Amoeba music, uh, which I, I think there, I, there, there's one in San Francisco, one there, and of course the, the one in Hollywood for all these years. But I think the one in Berkeley was the original and just like a block or two away is also Rasputin records, which I think had been around longer than Amoeba. And that's, and again, these are like great record stores and you go in there and there's just, there's a ton of, ton of vinyl. I mean, they're, they're you know, major vinyl shops, a lot of used, I mean, just very, very cool shops that have some very, uh, you know, a lot of cases, a lot of old product that's still sealed stuff that's been sitting there 20, 30 years, probably. Wow. So really a lot of gems to be found in places like that. You know, there was pawn shops. I like to go to pawn shops and, and see what kind of gear symbols, especially that there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, so I, I like to get out, but Berkeley was cool because I got a chance to go out and, and see these places and hit a pawn shop. And I think I bought some simples uh, <laughs> that day as well. So that was that was a good day. That was a real good day. It's good. See, even that just looks nice. It's better than, yeah. like I said, better than like sitting at my kitchen table, which is 
how I did a couple other interviews and then it was pointed out to me and they were like, um, you need a different background than the blinds next to you and your, you know, your living room behind you or something <laughs> like that. So then I was like, all right, well, I'm going to start doing interviews from here when I'm on the other end and I'm doing an interview for somebody else. And then it was just like, well, if I'm going to have like, if I'm going to start chatting with friends and doing interviews, that looks great. Then I might as well have a cool environment. And, and I started hanging memorabilia on all the walls. Cause this was all just like plain for the longest time for years. It yeah. was like sound and acoustic foam in here. Cause no one saw the inside of this room, but me. And yeah. so I did the studio upgrades to start recording in this room back in March. I started buying tapestries and I started cleaning up the walls and ripping stuff down and bringing stuff out. So I covered, you can't see it from here, but the wall behind me is all acoustic foam, but the wall here and the wall there behind there, the acoustic foam is covered with tapestries. Oh. And then above it, all the way around the room is banners um, from companies that I endorse and, and drum heads. I have five drum heads across this wall here from various bands I've been in. And then I got, you see there's two back there. And then yeah. a couple of, auto, those ones there are autographed, not even by bands, by hockey players. <laughs> close, close enough. I, this is, I got- Hey, hockey, I, hockey players use sticks too, so. You know. Right, you know, I got Ryan Miller up there and you know, so, um, and then again here, this wall is all storage with, with yeah. floor to ceiling road cases on shelving units. There's five drum kits in here. Wow. Four of them are Yamahas and three of them are set up. <laughs> nice. And so, I got it. Well, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll show you. Let's see. I'll give you uh, one view of where I keep stuff. There we go. Oh, gorgeous. That's, that's uh, not to brag. That's people say, oh, those are all, all those, all your gold records. I said, no, those are not all of them. There's yeah. some in the halls. There's some in my office. There's <laughs> one. We just got a double platinum for, actually, we got a double platinum for Bad Hair Day. Finally. Yeah, it went double platinum a while ago, and it just took a while to get the RIAA to sort of commit to the number and say, okay, now you're certified. Now you can go ahead and order some plex. Right. So we got, we got, uh, we like the old school uh, uh, ones with the vinyl. Oh, so yeah. we got a, a double vinyl one. They did a very nice, I can't quite get to it, That's but fine. it's going to go, it's going to go uh, like, like right there. Cause there's <laughs> a space there that's not being used. So that's going to go right, right there as soon as I can kind of, you know, yeah. And that'll be when you sit on the couch, it'll be like at eye level. So they'll turn around, they'll see this double platinum, which wow. is the, I, I guess that would be our best selling album. That's 2 million albums. So that, that's that, for that title. So that's, that's that. Oh, and I mean, Hey, you, you got enough gold on your wall behind you to prove that you're doing something right. So, yeah, well, or, or Al is anyway. Well, well, yeah, that's true. He doesn't have to keep me. He doesn't have to keep me just because I have a lot of photos of him. No. Well, though, some, of, some of which are coming out in the book. Now, but, a good blackmail tool. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing too salacious. I, I would, I would add that uh, with regard to the book. I mean, I'm not just completely surprising him with this thing. I, you know, I, I ran all of the photos I was considering by him, and he approved every one of them, which I was a little surprised because I thought there were a couple that were kind of iffy, and and uh, not quality wise, but just content wise. And and he said, nope, that's that's what I did and looked like and, or, you know, whatever, how I was dressed that day, that's, it's real, you know, keep it. So everything went through and uh, there's really, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. When I first saw the layout of the entire book and it's been about, about seven, eight weeks ago, I saw the, saw it and approved it and then it went off to the printer. Uh, when I saw it like as one piece, you know, all put together the way they had done it. It's like, I, I didn't have any changes. I said, you got, your guys did great work. Uh, the layout people are fans uh, of, of, so they, they lent a very nice objective look to the book. And uh, it really, really, I'm very, very proud of it. And, and I'm really happy that Al's letting me do that. I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't have much of a book if it weren't for him. Well, so I, I can't wait to see it. I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm really looking forward to checking the book out when it comes out. What, what's the date that it drops again? Uh, the, the actual published date is October 27th, okay. which is also a Tuesday. We all seem to like Tuesdays. Tuesday is still a book release date. There you go. Uh, and uh, 
I, I will, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be able to get you a book. Oh, that would be it's, fantastic, but I want you to sign it. You got to Well, we'll have to, we'll have to get together in person to do that, obviously. Well, maybe by October we'll be allowed <laughs> to do that. Hopefully. That really nice, because I, I miss you, and I'd love to see you, and I can't wait for the book, and thank you so much for, like, chatting with me for the last, you know, three hours, two. Well, I, I, you know, three. I, I got, I got nowhere to go. <laughs> It's great. Although I am, I am going to go to bed now. But yeah. you know, it's it's nice to catch up. This is about as social as I could get, is is on Zoom or you know or, or you know talking to someone on the phone. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But I, you know, I'm definitely talking to a lot more people that way and and zooming and skyping with people than ever before. You yeah. know, because it's just it's all we got. I mean, we can't really. You know, I saw a bandmate of mine for the first time in person the other day, and I hadn't seen him since March. You know, we didn't get terribly close to each other, but he dropped off. Uh, some CDs that, 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 you know, I'm on and, uh, you know, and I just, we sort of stayed a little bit apart and, you know, walked out in the, the front and chatted for a bit. And it's the first time we'd seen each other in person and we would normally get to, he lives right here in town with me. We would normally get together every week or two if we weren't already playing and I hadn't seen the guy in four months. Yeah. It seems so strange that so much time has passed and, and I talk to people regularly and I, even people I don't talk to that often, I've been like every couple of days making some rounds and just going through my phone book and sending a text to somebody and be like, Hey, just checking up on you and yeah. make sure you're healthy and you're safe and, and life is good for you. And I've just been hitting people up kind of at random, even if I hadn't talked to them in a year, just to, just to throw it out there and be like, Hey, just, wanting to make sure you're you're doing good kind of thing and that was another catalyst for wanting to try this zoom podcast uh -oh. chat thing yeah i just you know being able to do this is another way of being able to be social with friends and connect and um and it was just like well we're gonna sit and chat and catch up and and talk shop anyway why not just record it and throw it on the internet and see if anybody wants to watch it too you know, there's got to be somebody out there that finds our nonsense interesting. So I'll, I'll watch. I'll watch it. I'll watch it again. There you go. Good. So there's one. Um, there's one. Well, thank you very much. I'm gonna go home, make dinner, and and uh, call it a night, and then get up and do this all over again in the morning. So. Um, all right. Well, very good. Thank Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. It's nice to catch up, and uh, and good to see you. I, I haven't seen you since Nam. Yeah. Yeah. You, you had a very short, I remember you were, you were, it was the one minute you didn't have something you had to do somewhere you had to be and you stopped by and said hi. Total that <laughs> weekend, I think I spent less than 20 minutes on the convention floor total over the course of four days. Mm. Uh, this year was exceptionally um, crazy just between multiple performances and, and doing panel discussions and, and I was booked on interviews all day, every day. And it was, it was insane this year, so, but that's all a good thing. Like I'm not complaining um, as much as I like the social aspect and miss it. Um, work was, was good. So. Yeah, no, you've, you've, you've done well and uh, we'll continue to do well. And, and uh, you know, well, I hope so. That's, so. that's a good thing. Congratulations to you. And, and uh, you know, thanks. And I, I hope you get all the, all the guys you want on the podcast and uh, I, I look forward to it. So far, everybody I've asked has been saying yes, so I'm just stockpiling and, and just going to start filming conversations and interviews and videos and everything else and start releasing them. And, and uh, well, anybody who's watching this now is going to be like, what do you mean start releasing them? I'm watching it. Um, well, right. But, you know, we know that we're pre-taping it. So, <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much. Have a great night. It's been Alrighty. a pleasure.